the session. <clears throat> so I've just started the recording. So just for everyone's awareness, you're being recorded. The recording will be available afterwards, um, but that will not count as your recurrency training. So the recurrency training, uh, part of the requirement is that it is interactive. So we have built in interactive elements into the session today. And at the appropriate time, you will be prompted to uh, go to a particular website, enter in a code and, and um, participate. If you have a phone or a, a pad or a device or something to do that on, uh, that's a really nice way to be able to do that. For anyone who's watching the recording right now, um, if you are watching the recording, when get prompted, you won't be able to interact with the, uh, with the interactive elements because it is pre-recorded. Okay, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, excuse me, David. No. Um, I, Tony Burton, I put my information in chat, but I don't see how to actually make sure that I'm officially on the list. Um, yeah, oh, you know what, Tony, I'll, I'll do a double check when we're done. And then um, if, if it's missing, I know you and, and we'll make sure that we get you covered. Thank you. Yeah, David, there's, there's, there's a lot of names there. David, one other thing, can you mute everyone's mics? I will do that. Which is actually really good timing, Tom, because uh, we're just about to do our pre-flight briefing. So like any good pilot, I, oh, Adam, there we go. Um, any good pilot, we're going to, there we go. Uh, like any good pilot, we're gonna do a pre-flight briefing. So I'm gonna be your pilot in command today. Uh, our flight plan is for a three hour flight. We will be taking breaks at approximately the one hour mark. Uh, we'll do a seven minute break each time, enough time to get up, have a stretch and do some fluid adjustments. Um, wanna just talk briefly about CRM, AKA what is our behavioral norm? So Tom, thank you for that lead in. Uh, because of the size of our session today at 121 people, we're gonna have a standard of having people on mute unless you are chatting. Um, I would really like though to, to hear from you. We have the chat available. So that'll, that'll bring us into the features of Zoom. We have the chat available and you can access this by clicking down the bottom of the screen. If you hover your mouse, you'll see a, a menu up here. That's where your mute and unmute buttons are. Um, you should see chat in there. If you don't, the three buttons to the right with more, you'll find it there. And we are gonna be doing interactive elements um, through our sessions today. So I do highly encourage you to use the chat. If you haven't already, please enter in your name and license number so that we have record of you. Okay, we're gonna start off with our first poll right out of the gate. If you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and enter in this code, um, you will be asked some demographic questions. Just wanna get a bit of a sense for the team that we're working with today. So let's give everyone a few moments to do that. And again, if you have uh, a phone handy, that's a really good way to get at it. What's that website again? Menti, M-E-N-T-I. And then you can see the code at the top of your screen right now. If you need to, I can read it off. Yeah, best read it off, Dave. Say that again? Yeah, I cannot see the code because it's right behind the... Uh, 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 a tag from Zoom that says that I'm viewing David Donaldson's screen. <laughs> so you can drag that tag to the bottom if you want. 6592464. I'll read it again. And we've got just over 50 people. <clears throat> okay. Thank you so much for, for responding so promptly and quickly. Um, not unsurprisingly, the experience in the room today is very high at, at 20 plus. So 
you know, we've got quite, and, and the percentages at the top of these bars actually don't work because it's, it's comparing the GPLs to the, to the 20 pluses. So if we kind of visually look at the experience of one to five through 20 plus, um, we think about our population in the gliding community and, and honestly, we're, we're a bunch of old farts. And I, I can say that being a proud old fart. I am very glad though, to see that we've got some students here today. Uh, we've got quite a few glider pilots as well as a per percentage of instructors. So it looks like we've got about, mm, what would that be about two thirds, one third, not quite. Um, so interesting mix of, of, of folks today. And thank you so much for, for popping that in. Ooh, we're at 99, I'm gonna wait for one second. Let's get to a hundred and then we'll move on. There we go, there's a hundred, woo, -hoo. all right. So our agenda for today, we're gonna to start off with a review of the national safety report. Uh, we're gonna dig into a little bit of risk management within soaring with the focus being around situational awareness. I'll be turning it over to Dan for a piece on tow pilot safety. Uh, we then wanna get into a bit of accident prevention and safety margins. So we're gonna build out on that situational awareness piece and, and deal a little bit with some of that brain science. And I wanna to finish today with a bit of an open discussion around how can we improve safety and what can we do uh, both at the club level as well as nationally. I always like to think about a, a quote to uh, sort of set the theme or, or inspire us as we get started. And this one comes from Groucho Marx. When angry, you'll make the best speech you ever regret. Now, when you are triggered, when you get into a state where you are angry, where you get into that, that sort of you know, high emotional responsive state, um, this is when you don't tend to make your best decisions. And we're actually gonna investigate some of the brain science behind that, why that happens, what are some of the strategies that we have to combat that. So we're gonna to go to our second poll. Now, assuming that you did the first poll, if you refresh your screen, there should be a little button down the bottom that says take you to the next one. Uh, you'll only have to enter the code in once and you will be able to very quickly submit your response. <clears throat> Presumably you're referring to gliders only, Dave? Yes. Yes, I am, Dan. Yeah, so if you if you stayed current uh, with your power planes through the, the winter, I'm 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 thinking about those from the glider pilot perspective. <clears throat> And it, it's not lost on you why I'm asking you this question. I know that last year uh, when it came around to spring checks and we were going, well, we can't be you know, physically that close together in the airplane. And there was a lot of clubs, mine included, who made provisions to enable um, the skipping of, of the standard spring check. So I'm actually very encouraged to see the number of people who did spring checks and checking in with clubs, these numbers resonate as I heard while initially there was a few folks who said, you know what, we're gonna pass those spring checks. And there was talk of, you know, having an exemption. Um, most clubs actually did settle back in and, and do their checks. Um, it'll be interesting to see this year um, as we, you know, look at the starting of our season around what's going to happen there. So here's the concerns that are showing up in the national safety report. Uh, recency is a recurring issue. And um, I'm hearing reports, not only from within the glider community, but also in the professional pilot community. There's a huge concern right now with all these professional pilots who normally are flying, you know, multiple times in a week. They've been off for six, nine months, a year even, and they're now facing for probably the first time in their aviation career, the concept of returning to flying status after an extended period off. Um, interestingly, you know, that's kind of our norm as we you know, sort of shut down for the winter and then restart. The other big concern that I'm seeing in the numbers, and we're actually seeing this both in Canada as well as in the United States, I haven't checked with uh, my other associates around the world yet, but activity is down, but incidents are up. And this is showing up in our insurance. In last year's report, um, I had this message from the Soaring Safety Foundation uh, literally a couple days before I submitted my report last year. And soaring had nearly come to a halt, although the accidents and claims were up by approximately 
Um, fatalities had also increased significantly in that time period. They normally have one or two, and I think they had eight. So they were facing, and this was a direct quote from the uh, insurance company contacting the Soaring Society of America saying, you know, if unchecked, this is going to re re result in higher rates, potentially even the end of the SSA insurance coverage. Now, I've brought that back to the surface because as we're about to see, although we are faring better than the United States in that regard, we're not doing that much better. Um, our accidents in 2020, we did not have any fatals. Uh, seven of them were attributed to airmanship and one was medical. Uh, everyone I'm sure has heard the story by now of uh, Trevor's um, save on the mountain. So a big shout out to Trevor Florence for his, his diligence and his work there because I think he, he saved a life that day. Um, it's also a good story on FLARM and how FLARM can raise that level of situational awareness. As Trevor was keeping an eye on the other pilots around him, uh, he noticed that one of the gliders was A, not where it should be, and B, it had stopped moving. So uh, he determined that, you know what, this, this airplane has crashed. He immediately landed his glider, uh, commandeered a helicopter, and got on, onto the crash site on the side of the mountain within, I think it was about 20 minutes. Um, and also bringing search and rescue in in a, in a very, very short time. Um, accidents by phase, no, no real surprise here. Landing is still kind of our, our number one. I think it always will be. We've got this you know, physics thing of solid earth. Um, if you notice though, in the numbers at the bottom, last year we reported 10,205 launches. The year before we had 15,000. So we were down by approximately 34%. But you notice the corresponding number of incidents didn't change significantly. Um, when we look at the incidents, again, airmanship shows up as big ones. Operations showed up much bigger this year. Um, guessing a lot of that is due to the fact that because we had less flight operations, there was more ground operations. I know some clubs did take advantage of the downtime for getting some uh, of that work done. I did a statistic this year that I hadn't done before, which is I compared the number of flights per incident. And in 2019, we had 96.3 flights per incident. In 2020, we had 69 flights, 69.4 per incident. So while we had reduced activity, which did correspond with reduced incidents, those did not change in the same ratio. That means that we had basically a 30 odd percent increase in incidents based on the activity of the year. Now, when I presented this at the AGM, a question came back of, well, we usually have more incidents in the beginning and the end of the season, so we didn't have the middle period. Regardless of how we analyze this, we have a significant increase in the rate of incidents per flight, and that is concerning. Now, when we look at the insurance, the SAC insurance did increase by 5.5% this year, which is actually a really good result because overall we had a huge spike in um, hull losses, hull loss ratio, as well as the overall uh, loss ratio in 2019. So let's zoom in on this a little bit and, and, and talk a little bit about what we're, take a closer look at what we're talking about here. You'll notice that in if we look at uh, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, we went from 257 gliders insured, 297 in 2019, and dropped down to 250 in 2020. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm surprised it didn't drop a little lower than that. But when we look at the hull losses in thousands of dollars, we went from a low in 2017 of $125,000 to almost $300,000 last year. So we doubled, we more than doubled the um, payouts by the insurance company whilst, while at the same time slightly reducing the number of aircraft insured. And you can see the graph there, we had a huge spike in 2019 and that spike was actually more around the total loss ratio because you notice the total loss ratio was quite high there and that's because of the fatal accident. Um, so our hull loss ratio was much better uh, in 2017 through 2019. And in 2020, we had a hull loss ratio of 231. In very simple terms, this is not acceptable by the insurance companies. Now, while they will take a spike like that once in a while, 
if those types of numbers continue, we will have a combination of a significant increase in our insurance rates, along with a significant difficulty in getting insurance. So when we think about what's happening and the progress that we're making on this aviation safety front, um, the picture's not quite that rosy this year as we had a higher number of incidents per flight. We had much higher insurance claims. Um, in, in simple terms, folks, we're breaking our toys and, and we're gonna run out of toys. <laughs> so let's think about uh, last three years, I've been tracking the number of open canopy spoilers open on takeoff as well as the gear up landings. And then last year I added to that ground loops. In 2018, we had five canopies, five spoilers and eight gear ups. In 2019, we reduced it to two and four respectively maintaining eight gear ups. Um, this year, we were down to five gear up landings, but considering the reduction in the number of flights, I would say that's pretty much tracking to, to, uh, to the same ratio. The open canopies um, in 2019, um, it was either 2019 or 2018, an open canopy resulted in a written off glider. As the canopy opened shortly after takeoff, they aborted the takeoff and ended up doing significant damage to the airplane on the resulting landing off the end of the field. Uh, in, in 2020, we had a similar story. In this case, a rear canopy of a two-seater opened, departed the aircraft and significantly damaged the appanage as it, as it flew past. Um, when you think of that description, you know, I'm, I'm counting those folks lucky that the damage wasn't, um, to a greater extent, they were able to maintain control of the aircraft. So while these things seem pretty innocuous, they can, they can quickly lead to a lot of damage and, and written off airplanes. As I go through all of the incidents in the year, um, I always like to identify what I like to call my favorite incident. And this particular one was, um, first of all, I wanna do a big thank you to the pilot who reported this because the amount of reporting that we are getting now and the, the openness for people to have these conversations is, is quite refreshing and I really, really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, although I have edited this down, this is mostly his words, several errors on the first flight of the season. So for context, it was a hot day, it was a good soaring day. So here we have a picture of a late start to the season. We've got a good soaring day, someone's itching to get in the air. They arrived late at the airfield. They were delayed in finding help to rig their airplane. They were delayed again when they realized they had to update their farm. So already we had three identified delays. In the ensuing rush to get in the air, uh, he ended up setting his altimeter at minus 200 feet instead of 800 feet AGL. So his altimeter is now reading 1000 feet below normal. During the initial takeoff, uh, and his checks, he omitted to check his spoilers during pre-launch. This resulted in an unusual rumble and a longer than normal takeoff roll. And a, it resulted in a, in a slower than usual climb out and a very rapid sink rate after release, at which point he then noticed his spoilers. Now this is a privately owned single place aircraft. This is a, an experienced licensed pilot. And you can see the chain of events leading up, but we're actually not done yet. So arriving late, multiple factors, spoilers open on tow, there's multiple pieces there. During the tow, he thought his altimeter was reading wrong because his visual clues was not lining up with, with what his altimeter was saying, which kind of makes sense because now that the altimeter is reading, um, you know, 800 feet AGL, he is, you know, a thousand and, and <laughs> 800 feet AGL. So he asked for a wave off at 3000 feet looked down at his altimeter, saw the tow plane diving away, immediately pulled the release. Um, the tow pilot was interviewed from their perspective, the person got out of position. So not only was he rushing into the air, missed a couple of different factors, got you know his altimeter setting incorrect, also managed to get himself out of, tow, out of position on tow without realizing it after the release, realized that his spoilers were open. As I said, this is a privately owned single place higher performance glider flown by an experienced pilot. And we think about the effects of rushing. And when we get into mid or even late season, 
we're actually much more capable of going quickly. And I'm, I'm being careful in my words here. I'm not saying rushing, I'm saying moving quickly. When we're doing those first flights, we wanna slow down, we wanna take our time. We wanna really be very prescriptive around this because we haven't practiced these things for, for a number of months. And for some of us, that time is gonna be over a year. The way our memory works, the way our brain works is our brain is constantly rewiring itself. And as we do something over and over and over again, our brain says, let me make that easier for you. And what it does is it creates new neural pathways. And as you stop practicing something, it starts to allow those neural pathways to um, actually be, be kind of harvested, if you will. And, and they stop being used. So this is the old use it or lose it adage. This is why we do spring checks. So when you are rushing, whether that's mid season, beginning of the season, end of season, we can miss little things. And of course, uh, you can see the myriad of, of little things that are being missed in this, in this picture. Um, this was sent to me by a fellow instructor. And he says, hey, you might, be, might find this useful in, your, uh, in, your, in one of your sessions. So for fun, I started to count the number of things I could spot that was wrong. And I think I stopped at around 20. Suffice it to say, when we see our friends up there thermaling and it's a beautiful day and, and we're, you know, we're, we're itching to get into the air, this is when we're primed. Um, and then we also have external pressures. Yes, dear, I will definitely be home by four o'clock. Um, I remember having a good chat with a friend who was in a contest one time and, or, no, sorry, it wasn't a contest, it was just a flying day and he'd been, he promised his wife he'd be home by four. And, was you know facing a low save and you know trying to pull it and then he he caught himself and said I'm I'm about to become one of those statistics he lowered the gear pulled out the spoilers and landed out so we want to think about you know the consequences of those decisions and and how that's going to play out as we as we move forward a quick reminder of the wing runner checklist um, I truly believe this is making a difference in last year's report we had a wing runner who actually caught uh, a pretty serious misconfiguration of a glider in terms of the belts. Um, they weren't done up. They were hanging out the, the side after the canopy was closed. And, you know, an, an incident was prevented. Um, there was at least two reports of tail dollies that were caught, you know, where people had not, you know, been, been gridded and hooked up and were about to take off and the tail dolly was there and the wing runner caught that. The wing runner is part of your crew. Treat them as such. Now, I always like to highlight the good catches. So the good catch is the incident report that they caught something in time and prevented it from developing and, and progressing. In this particular choice, the glider was close to the ridge. The ridge was off to the right side. Both the glider and the tow plane went and upon release turned left because turning right would have put the glider into the ridge. The glider radioed the tow plane to stop turning and fly straight to clear a path for the glider. Now, I'm gonna pop you back into Menti, and this is your opportunity to type a bit of a sentence. Why did I choose that as my favorite one? What, what, what about that is such a good highlight that we wanna, we wanna discuss that in a little bit greater detail? We'll give a, a few extra moments for this one. <clears throat> I'm loving the answers that are coming in here. Okay. And love the honesty for the person who typed in no idea. Awesome. <laughs> That's what we're here for. We're here to have a discussion. So comms is definitely key, but I love that first one that popped in that says comms is key to unusual events. Here we had an unusual event. It was a standard tow. The release was done. The glider was unable to turn to the right. So they were forced to turn to the left. This is what we're also seeing pop in situational awareness. So we got into a situation where there was a disconnect in our standard procedures. Now we have standard procedures for the purpose of making our actions predictable. The tow pilot was able to do their predictable action, which was turned to the left. The glider pilot was not. So they took action to radio and contact the, 
the, the tow pilot. And there was a response and a confirmation back and forth. So, you know, the reason that I keyed onto that is the communication and most importantly is the situational awareness and, and acting on it, right? So we think about, you know, standard tow SOPs don't work on a ridge, right? Don't work with ridge SOPs, absolutely. So we need to think about what does that look like? And, but, you know, having that communication, having that, that um, um, uh, you know, that, that connection and that, that awareness that, hey, you know what, there, there's some things that could be going on here. Right. Um, if we think about from a ridge SOP perspective versus a, a flatland SOP perspective, I do not know if that pilot was a visiting pilot or if that was their home base. Um, but regardless, you know what? We both needed to do a left turn, turn away from the ridge. The glider pilot saw that the, the tow plane was, was still turning and then, um, you know, reached out and communicated. I'm really liking this one item that's right in the middle of my screen right now. It shows that the glider pilot considered the tow pilot part of his crew and is willing to communicate. Well, very well said, thank you. When you are flying on a glider or you're flying the tow plane and you're connected by a rope, we have this very unique situation in aviation of two airplanes being operated by two pilots, but yet they're connected together and the actions of one pilot will impact the other. So, you know, having that situational awareness, having that communication, 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 but not only having that situational awareness, but also acting on it. Love it. There we go. So this brings us into what I really wanna dig into today which is around situational awareness. So I'm gonna pose two questions here. We're gonna pop these two questions up separately uh, and get you to answer much like you just did. And I wanna start off by just sort of defining what is situational awareness? How would you describe that? You're a pilot, you've been trained in this. Many of us are instructors, we teach other people in this. You know, I'm someone who's just, you know, straight off the street, no idea. And I ask you, what, what's situational awareness? How would you answer that? constant reevaluation of the situation you're in ah, i love it dino thank you yes constant reevaluation of the situation and if you can't type into the mentee chat if you want to unmute and, and speak your answer totally happy with that always good to hear other people's voices too right Okay. All right, let's take a look at what we have here for some of these. Knowing what is around you, using that information to inform decisions, constantly reassessing, really like that one, right? Knowing what to look for. Absolutely. Um, being aware of your surroundings, uh, knowing where you are and what, excuse me, and when, comparing it to where you should be and when. So really thinking about, is my current situation lining up with my belief? Big picture, love that one. Blinkers off, oh yes, absolutely. Um, the OODA loop or SOAR as we like to use. Um, what is the OODA loop for those who don't know? Can whoever type that in, if you want to un, un, unmute and, and just remind us what the OODA loop is. Hi, Eve Bastian here. I didn't write it, but I can answer the question. Go for it, Eve. It stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. And mm -hmm. uh, it was developed by a U.S. Marine a consultant uh, to help guide fighter pilots in the Korean War. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a really good one. It, it's, it's effectively the same as SOAR, um, you know, slightly different acronym. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was, I was the one who wrote the OODA loop, just out to my microphone. It's, okay. it's, it's literally what he just said. That was a pretty good explanation, except uh, the person in question, John Boyd, was actually in the Air Force, not the Marines. So just a All right. bit of a story. 
Wonderful. Thanks for. Uh, um. <laughs> Thanks, Amir. Okay. Um, so it, it's about, and the key here is that reevaluation, that reevaluation, that reevaluation. And, and the OODA loop, the key there is the loop part. This is not a one and done. This is not a, you know, I've taken a look out. So imagine you're flying along for, for a couple hours and you take a look out once and then you don't look out again for the next hour and continue to fly along based on that initial information that you had. I know that that sounds absolutely ridiculous. But when we look at some of the, the, the definitions that are flowing by, you know, keeping your eyes and other senses open and, uh, and an attitude, a safety attitude about you, right? So it's that whole, you know, how are we approaching that? So there's an attitude element here as well, right? Um, not having to pause your attention and flying to assess the current situation. So being constantly aware, you know, that mental picture of what's around you. And of course, being pilots, we're working into three dimensions. So thinking in terms of that big picture, you know, being aware of your of your situation. Loving this, excellent. Okay, let's move to the second one. The second question. Whoops, I went too far there, apologies. How do you know you've lost situational awareness? So we talk a lot about situational awareness. We talk a lot about what it is. We also use this term loss of situational awareness. As a pilot, I'm flying along and I've lost my situation awareness. How do I know that? And I'm going to give. I'm going to let a few uh, a few answers come in. <laughs> I love this one. The safety report said you did. <laughs> um, that shock when you see something you didn't expect. Uh, feeling behind your flight, surprise. Feeling that you're behind the aircraft something foreseeable comes as a surprise, right? So surprise. Now, this is the really insidious piece. When you are surprised by what happened, you have actually not experienced loss of situational awareness. You've experienced a regaining of your situational awareness. And the very first answer that came in is the answer that, that I like to go with. It's, it's scrolled off the top, but it says, you do not. So loss of situational awareness is extremely insidious because you do not know that you've lost your situational awareness. The moment that you become aware that you have lost your situational awareness, you are actually now situationally aware. That said, all of these answers that you're giving are extremely valuable and useful. Things aren't adding up. There's surprises. You're getting surprised. Um, you know, you, 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 you for, unfortunately don't know, but you find yourself without a task at hand. You're not working. Okay, so you're probably wanting to start to question what's going on, right? Um, it is tricky, but if you feel like you don't know what's happening, you've lost that situational awareness. Absolutely, well said. Um, you know, being in the unknown, not 100% not sure what, what you mean by that, but I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more on that. Um, you know, there's a flarm alert and you haven't seen the airplane. So whoever wrote the being in the unknown, if you want to unmute and just fill us in a little bit, that'd be great. Some mental confusion, absolutely. So these are all great indicators to say, you know what? I, I need to, to kind of reevaluate where I am, what am I, what am I doing, right? Um, <laughs> you need some situational awareness to realize you've lost situational awareness. I love that one, awesome. Um, yeah, you get a surprise. So we're, 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 all, we're all hitting in the right ballpark here, folks. So we think about what does that look like? And I'm gonna run a quick little um, awareness test. Okay, so my screen's gonna go black for a second. Now, I'm gonna run a quick little video here. It's about a 30 second video. I'll need your, your sound on for this. And I'm just gonna turn my sound up. Here we go, okay. Here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. Okay. If you go down to your, your menu bar on Zoom, there's a reactions 
give me a little thumbs up, thumbs down. Did you get that? Did you count 13? Alan's laughing and crying. Sheldon, yeah, okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some yeses and some noes. A little bit hard on, on, the, on the stuttery video sometimes. Okay, now here's the real test. This. Did you see the bear? Yeah. Yeah, that's the real test. Now I, it, it should. But you did you see the moonwalking bear? So this was originally a study done um, by Stanford University professor. And he, he tried it with just some students in the hallway. They videoed them, you know, passing a ball around. And it worked so well that he redid it and redid it and redid it. And time and time again, people missed the moonwalking bear. Uh, if you search on YouTube, you'll find multiple versions of it. There's one with a Star, Star Wars stormtrooper who goes through the center. Um, I first used this probably 10 or 15 years ago. I've rewatched it myself, even though I know the bears there, if I pay attention closely to count the number of passes, you can easily uh, miss the bear. David? Yes. I, 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 I have seen something similar to this. And you can argue that the test is not fair because you're asked to focus on something whether in situational awareness, you are supposed to, uh, to maintain a general awareness of the situation that could where you are, right? Totally so agree. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky, uh, a skewed test. Well, it is and it isn't, Gustavo, because are you familiar with the L-1011s, the Eastern Airlines L-1011 that crashed in the Florida Everglades in 1972? I was too young. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I can still brief, say that. <laughs> yes, I can hear Alan Mills laughing heartily because he knows this story well. Um, in 1972, an Eastern Airlines L-1011 was flying over the continent of the United States and it crashed killing, I think it was something like half the people on board. And the entire reason that it crashed is there was a single light bulb that was burnt out and the crew got so focused on dealing with this light bulb and, and the misinformation that it was actually giving them because they were getting a false indication of some system that they did not realize they had taken the airplane off of the autopilot. They accidentally disabled the autopilot and the airplane gently descended and crashed into the Everglades. The point of this test, Gustavo, and I agree with you, it is, it is kind of leads you to a fail the point of it is we can take the lesson as pilots that we need to be careful that we do not over-focus on a single item. So let's think about some of that wonderful electronics that we have in our cockpit now with our moving map displays and with the Enigma to show us how far we can glide with our current altitude and wind condition, et cetera. And we're staring very intently at our screen and we're not seeing the airplane that's about to crash into us or we get hyper-focused on a particular issue or distraction. There are many accident stories of people who crash perfectly serviceable airplanes because they got distracted by something. Now, I was flying as a, an instructor one day and my student in the front seat on takeoff at about 50 feet above the ground started moving kind of oddly and the glider started rapidly climbing out of position. And I said, is there something wrong? And he quickly put the airplane glider back into position and then started doing whatever it was he was doing again. I said, what's wrong? And this is the only time as an instructor, I've been reaching for the release and the controls at the same time at a, a you know, 50 feet above the ground. His answer back was my seatbelt has come undone. So here we have a near solo student who instead of flying the airplane at 50 feet above the ground on tow, was, re was, was focused on buckling his seatbelt. 
So I asked him, can you fly the airplane without your seatbelt? And he said, but my seatbelts come undone. I said, can you fly the airplane? To which he resumed flying the airplane. And I said to him, if you need me to take over so that you can do your seatbelt up, I will happily do that. Just tell me what you want to do. Fortunately, he flew the rest of the tow without a seatbelt, we released, and we dealt with it after the tow. The point of this, and it's called an awareness test, a little bit tongue in cheek, but the point of this, Gustavo, is exactly what you just said. We got distracted, we focused on a particular thing, and we didn't see the other thing that came in. And that's the got point. it. It's, it's good. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's less about pass or fail of the test. It's more about how do we apply this to what we do? And how do we as pilots manage our awareness so that we don't hyper-focus on something at the expense of something else? Love it. Thank you so much for that. So as we continue our conversation around situational awareness, what are some of the factors affecting your situational awareness? If you're tired. Yeah, absolutely. Tired, right? So, so thinking about health and, um, you know, as, as an extension of that. So there's general health, there's, there's workload, distractions, fatigue, sleep, lack of, right? Age, um, loss of energy, right? Mental, physical condition, right? A busy environment with lots of stimulus, right? We've got, you know, 12 things to do. Um, gliders are becoming much more complex. Imagine you're flying a, a complex um, tow plane with a constant speed prop and cowl flaps. And, you know, you've got, you know, certain speeds where you can extend the flaps or not. And, you know, how you do the letdown and so forth. Uh, I'm really loving this one in the middle right now. Fatigue, hunger, full bladder. Um, you know, having that sense of got to go, got to go, got to go. Right. You know, uh, that, that very short couple minute circuit suddenly feels really, really long. Right, fatigue and stress, hydration. Um, last season, we had two people pass out uh, from dehydration during a contest, or, or two seasons ago. Um, distractions on the ground, right? So we have the I am safe checklist for that. I love this one over here. Thank you so much, whoever put that in. Lazy. Absolutely. That is going to affect your situational awareness, right? We are, we are entering into a very unforgiving environment when we climb into that cockpit. We need, we need to be there. Um, wife and kids, distractions, lack of sleep, dehydration. Oh, here's another good one. The new instrument. Absolutely. Um, when I first got XC SOAR, before I ever brought it into the cockpit, I played with it, first of all, at my desk for quite a bit. And then I would drive around with it on my car and I would put it up on the, on the, you know, where I normally have my GPS for my, uh, for driving. And I would just leave it there and just, just get used to it being there. Just sort of acclimatize myself to it. So that I wasn't kind of focusing on it. Right. Task saturation, overload. Love it. Yeah. Tunnel vision. Right. Can't multitask. We're going to dig into that one. That's a good one. Love it. Okay. Some mental fatigue. There's decision fatigue that pops in, right. Being tired. If there's lots of traffic. There's lots of going on. Right, life in general, absolutely. Life can be a huge distraction. Love it. Yeah, rushing. Mm -hmm. Focusing on avionics problems in the cockpit, you know, the flarm, the flight computer, the radio, the vario, et cetera. Right, fatigue, worry, lack of ability to concentrate. Yeah, these are all fantastic. Love it. Okay. So I'm just going to do that mute all. David, did you see the one about club culture? Um, I did not notice it. Talk to me a little bit about club culture. How is that? How can that affect my situational awareness? I don't know. Someone put that up, and I was just curious about that. I, I would love someone who either was the author of that or or someone who's willing to talk about it. Talk to me a little bit about club culture. How does that affect our situational awareness? I didn't write that, but uh, I can address that. Thank you. It, it's the mindset that that you have when you fly and the mindset is what you have for you personally, but it's monkey see monkey do. If you don't have a club culture, which encourages everything to be, for, for you to be a better pilot, to, to be aware of things, then you won't do. Uh, 
that, that's how I interpret. I, I wish I would have written that. Yes, it was a very good one. Thank you. And I, and I think your interpretation, John, is, is very good because it is monkey see, monkey do. If I'm in a culture, if I'm in a club with a, with a good culture versus a bad culture, you know, that, that is definitely going to impact how I as an individual behave. Uh, Pavan. Yeah, I experienced this in a different way. Um, I've seen people where they're distracted um, or preoccupied with following the rules of the club or the guidelines because they're um, they're kind of what's the word for it? They're almost like they're paranoid about oh I better follow this rule I better follow that rule or I'll be criticized my my flight will be ruined my day will be ruined yeah. I won't be welcome. There's that fear of judgment so that yeah. they have to behave a certain way rather than doing what's necessarily comfortable enjoyable yeah. or possibly safest in that moment. Yes. And I think the word you're looking for is punitive. There is a definite a punitive thing, even if it's not a policy. There's a social punitive thing that is very alive. Absolutely, absolutely. I was uh, chatting with a friend about a recent accident uh, that happened down at the seniors in Florida. Um, the, the good news is the gentleman survived. He was quite badly injured and still in the hospital. Um, but as we were talking about some of the factors in our phone conversation, and, and it literally had happened the day before. So him and I were just kind of chatting through some of the possibilities. I asked him whether there was a sense of um, get their itis to continue the, the, the launch. So what happened is he dropped the wing on, on, on takeoff. Uh, the airplane um, turned to the left and then it slingshotted into a, a parked vehicle. Um, and I said to him, you know, how many planes were behind him? And he says there was about 30 planes. And how many tow planes? There was five. They had two landing lanes. They had three takeoff lanes. And they were quite proud that they had launched, I think it was about 60 gliders in the course of an hour for the contest. And there he is in the middle of the pack. So imagine that you're sitting there in your glider and you've got 30 people behind you and there's five tow planes that are orbiting and picking up people and launching and picking up people and launching as we, as we go through this very choreographed um, scenario. And I said, I wonder if there was a bit of a, you know, we, we teach the second the wing drops, you know, abort the takeoff and he did not. Um, unfortunately, it was a combination of the uh, C of G hook and, you know, the wing drop, et cetera. So there is that, absolutely. There is that, that whole sense of, you know, you promised your wife you'd be home at four o'clock. You, you know, every time someone gets la landed out, they get ribbed and they get ridiculed. And, you know, or if you do something like aborting a takeoff, um, you know, yeah, it, it, can be, it can be very insidious. So something that I'm a huge fan of is celebrate those decisions. If you ever have a pilot who aborts a takeoff, celebrate them, buy them a beer, thank them. Um, you know, even though it's an interruption to the day and it's a it's an interruption to the the uh, the process. So you guys are on it. I'm loving this. Strategies for improving, right? Um, do it consciously. I love that. Do it consciously, right? So things like checklists, applying store, um, taking a pause, breathe. <sighs> yeah, just you know, like literally, physically taking it, taking a good old breath, right? Practice. Ask yourself continuously. Um, stay busy if you're not checking, right, and adjusting something, <laughs> then you're doing something wrong. Love it. Um, press the reset button. Absolutely. You know, we can always we can always go. You know, okay, let's let's you know get get a kind of restart here. Um, some teamwork. Love that one. Yes, because you know you can see so much, and this is where, you know, we use it right at the start of our flight when we have that wing wing runner run our wing. They're looking above and behind for us to see if there's anything coming in. Um, doing briefings, right? Um, you know, having a briefing not only for myself, for my crew, for the people that are inside my airplane with me, but what about a briefing with the tow pilot? What about a briefing with the everyone on the field that morning before you start your your flying ops for the day? That kind of stuff. Okay, I'm really liking this one. Be serious about the I'm safe checklist. You know, um, this is not a, you know checkbox exercise, hey, I, I did my checklist, I'm good. This is about honestly, seriously saying, am, am I actually here today? Am I 100%? Should I be in the cockpit? You know, that kind of thing, loving this, okay. So we've talked a little bit about what situational awareness is, 
we've talked a little bit about what you know what we could do to to uh, to to you know improve our situational awareness. It's kind of funny, but we need a little bit of awareness around our situational awareness. But we also want to have some awareness of how we function. And the first element of this that I want to do is just talk a little bit about multitasking. And there's a myth that humans can multitask. Our brains are self-limiting mechanisms. They can really only focus on one thing. And this, this comes out of Dr. Edward de Bono's work. And this concept is called channelized attention. So I can focus on one thing at a time. So I focus on task A, I switch and I focus on task B. How skilled we are really dictates how much we can or how much energy, time, and attention we need to focus on certain things. And this is where as we get more practiced, we become more able to do things with less amount of attention and focus on that task. When we get into physical activities, our brain will rewire to the point where those physical activities become something we do as we like to refer to as on autopilot. If you can think back to when you first learned to drive, especially if it was standard, or you first learned to ride a bike, or you first learned to fly, you had to actively concentrate on what it was. And instructors will all resonate with this. It is so easy to overload a student, right? I mean, they can do nice, good coordinated turns up, in, up at altitude, and they're, they're actually flying really good. You get down into the circuit, you ask them to run the checklist and keep the airplane you know, straight and level with a proper speed, with a proper coordinated turn, and, and stuff starts to fall apart because they are having to use all of their time and attention on focusing on that one thing. You know, do a radio, tra a radio call and all of a sudden the person stops flying the plane. Now, as we develop the skill, especially the motor skills, we need less of our conscious attention to that skill. And we can now direct our conscious attention at other places. And the insidious thing here is that if we do get distracted, we lose some of those items. We also get into this false sense of, I can actually do these multiple things at once because you know I've got this higher level skills. We talked about distractions in the cockpit. This is a club glider with a, with a full moving map display. And I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in this cockpit. And I'm, I'm starting to hear reports of people, you know what, I'm seeing people with their heads down in the cockpit. They're not up on a swivel. They're not looking around in contests. This is getting concerning. The next piece I want to just touch on briefly is around stress versus pressure. So this comes out of a, a session that I did a few years back around the neuroscience of safety. And we have stress and we have pressure. And when you think about what is the difference, it's very hard for most people to define what that is. Stress will actually improve your performance. Pressure reduces your performance. Now, this chart uh, it comes out of... Um, uh, it's actually Dodson's Law, which was from a study in 1908, where they looked at, as they increase stress, scientific word they're using as arousal, right? When they increase stress, it increases performance. Now, you get to this point of optimal arousal, optimal performance, or as I like to say, optimal anxiety. When you are in that higher stress situation, you go to a contest, for example, you're, you're, you're learning something new in your flight training, perhaps you're going solo for the first time, that kind of thing it tends to bring our stress levels up and correspondingly our performance comes up to a certain point. And then when it becomes too much, we've kind of overamped and we've, we've gone past that point. And this is what we do as instructors a lot is we manage the anxiety and stress levels of the student so that we don't give them too much. We give them enough to bring their, their performance up, but not too much. Think about how your performance is when you're bored. Right, it goes down. It, it it doesn't do well. But when we when we get you know that into that higher stress situation, our performance tends to go up. So when we think about this pressure, on the other hand, our performance degrades. And this is out of a book called Performing Under Pressure. They did a, a research study around this. Three factors they identified: the outcome is important, the outcome is uncertain, and you feel like you're being judged. I'm going to tie this back to Jean's comment earlier around the culture of the club. If you feel like you're being judged, your performance will go down. 
So we need to create an environment where we can reduce that level of judgment, that sense of judgment. Now, the key word here is feel like you're being judged, not whether you are being judged or not is irrelevant. It's actually whether you feel like you're being judged. And this has been applied in the world of sports psychology. You'll notice most of the high level sports, uh, especially the Olympic level sports, they don't talk about you know, what the judges think. They always turn it inwards and how did I perform today? And what was my personal best? And whether I get the medal or not doesn't really matter. We can reduce the outcome uncertainty by practice, practice, practice. This is why we are so big on, if you haven't done that type of a maneuver before, or you haven't done it for a while, go up with an instructor, you know, go up with a safety pilot. You can go and experience it, get to know it, try it a few times. You can have that predictable outcome, right? Now, the outcome is important. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, you know, you can you could say actually in aviation, everything's important. But let's put this in the context of where most of our accidents happen on landing. How important is it that you place the airplane on the numbers or stop before the taxiway? If you roll past the taxiway and get out and push the glider back, who cares? It's not that important. We'd much rather you have you down and safe in one piece than have a broken airplane, you know, you know, 10 feet shy of the end of the runway, that kind of thing. So pressure adversely affects our cognitive success. It downgrades our behavioral skills. Most performance, uh, most, most people perform below their capacity when they're under pressure and it is often camouflaged. And today we feel this, this increasing sense of pressure. So how do we deal with this? Let's remove some of the uncertainty. Let's do visualization. Visualization is extremely powerful. Our neurons, our brains have a hard time distinguishing between we're doing actual real practice and visualization practice. In fact, you can even grow muscle mass by visualizing working out. So people who are you know, in the gym working out, they would grow muscle mass and then they got people to visualize and work out. And those folks grew more muscle mass than the ones who didn't. Then they did a third group who did visualization only. And guess what? They actually grew some muscle mass. Preparation. The better we are prepared. Um, as glider pilots, we tend to not be as prepared for our flight as most other types of pilots because our flights are a little less predictable but we can prepare ahead. So, you know, taking the right amount of food of your expected flight, taking the right amount of, of water. Um, you know, there's a number of, of incident reports I've received over the years that talk about, oh, we were planning for just a short flight and it ended up being four hours. So I didn't have my water with me, All right? Um, remove judgment from yourself as well as, you know, within the culture of your, your um, within the culture of your club. And then also reduce, reduce the perceived importance you know, the fact that I, I landed a little bit long and rolled a little bit further down the runway, that's okay, right? It's not that important that I actually stop on the numbers. So pressure is the important plus the uncertainty plus the feeling being judged. Now, a key to, to combating this, as we've already discussed, situation uh, the SOAR model. So what's the situation? This is a picture of my neighbor's house at 2 a.m. Um, this was a couple of years ago, just before Christmas. My dog woke me up in the middle of the night. I stepped outside and I could see 12 foot high flames coming from the garage of our house and called the fire department. So what's the situation? What are the options? I went around and knocked on people's doors, woke them up. Uh, what actions, right? And then repeat. And we need to be constantly doing this over and over and over again. Okay. When we pair that with the other tools that we have, we think about what are the barriers that we have as we see the chain of events starting. And I want you to think about that first incident that I shared with you this morning or this afternoon. The one where that pilot identified multiple things. There was unusual noise rolling down the runway. There was unusually slow climb out. Notice heavy sink after lift. So there you saw the multiple events, right? showed up late to the field, had to update the farm, couldn't find people to help him rig his glider. He's rushing because it's a nice day. Again, what's the barrier that we can put in place? Now, I did not follow up with him, but I would love to know if he actually did a critical assembly check that day. After putting his glider together as he's rushing to try to get to the field, you know, did he do a critical assembly check and perhaps found something that he had missed that was like, oh, thank God I did that. There's the effective barrier, but they only work when we actually do them. Okay, we're gonna take a pause here. We'll do our, our break. Uh, we'll go for seven minutes. I'm seeing 2.06 on the clock, so check your times. Um, I'm gonna invite you to mute and 
uh, turn off your camera, but please stay on with us. And we're going to be back here at 2.13 to continue. Okay. We'll see you back at 2.13. And when we come back, Dan Cook's going to take over for the tow pilot safety practices. Dan, I've stopped sharing if you wanted to get your share started. Okay, Duke. And we'll get started at 2.13. David, are you on? Yes, I'm still here. Oh, there's uh, something, you're talking about the stress levels and uh, too little stress uh, is no good for preventing in incidents also. Uh-huh. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, it actually a little, you were saying reduce the pressure level, perhaps, you know, making deliberately uh, bringing the, your own pressure level up a little bit is better. Yeah. So for example, uh, you were mentioning about, uh, you know, crossing the, the intersection mm -hmm. uh, and not bothering about it. But if you deliberately say, I am not going to cross that intersection, that will improve the attention you're paying to your approach. Yep. And so you should be thinking about making sort of your own spot landings uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. Don't bother about that. You're getting sloppy. Agreed. Now, when I say um, putting it on the, on the numbers on the end of the runway, Tony, we want to separate a spot landing from putting it on the numbers. Because I can spot land at any point down the runway. Exactly. Right? So now we're into a question of precision versus, y y y you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I, you, should always, you should always be uh, personally trying to be precise. Exactly. And yeah. if, you, if you stop being precise, you're being a, a lazy and also you're losing some situational awareness. Absolutely, totally agree. And okay, in that so precision, in that precision, you think about, you know, how well did I do and, and evaluate myself, but at the same time not feeling judged by others. Yeah, okay. Right? For example, I, personally, I've, it, I, I'm getting bored if I'm just flying around. <laughs> I, I find that uh, my, my speed uh, control is, is is slipping my ability yep. my precise turns are slipping yep whereas if i'm actually do, doing something i'm going cross country i'm concentrating on it all the time yeah I'm increasing my arousal level yep i agree totally agree totally agree it could be a speed versus accuracy thing or not uh precision versus accuracy yes right precision yes. is as you drop down you know, every time, like if you're aiming for the numbers and every time you drop down is 20 yards beyond the numbers, then your precision is accurate to that 20 yard spot. Right. A so now, accuracy is hitting where you're aiming. Exactly. So that, yeah, and, and I think consistency, right? Because if I'm consistently in your example here, 200 meters past the numbers, you know, I, I've aimed at the numbers, I'm consistently 200 meters past, you know, how do I adjust that so that I actually go where I plan to go? Right, so I can accurately put it down. And we take that into Tony's, I'm going cross country. Now we're into the, I'm, I'm outlanding. How accurately can I place my airplane you know, on that field that I'm looking down at from a thousand feet? Love it. I, think it, I think it's also important to, to keep the skill level of the pilot in mind for that kind of thing, right? It's great for, for just to always challenge yourself and always push yeah. yourself further. But when a kid is you know, just licensed or freshly solo, uh, you know, land on the runway. Yes. You know, and, don't land in this 20 feet of the runway, just park the airplane safely. Right. Um, and, you know, and, and or, or on tow, you know, we, we might say, keep the horizon between the wheels and the, the wing. Whereas the, the experienced pilots might say, I want the horizon to bisect the tires. Yes. And, so. and this is exactly what I'm talking about, Chris, when I say about, you know, remove that sense of judgment. Here's, here's the, the level that we want you to work at. We're not going to judge you if you're off a little bit. Let's now think about, you know, is that serving you? Do you have enough of a skill level, you know, and is there an opportunity for development? Yeah. Love it. Thank you. Okay. Got about hey, two hey. more minutes. Yeah, Alan? 
uh, on your Swiss cheese model, was that my picture of uh, Jan Jurgensen or Jan uh, in the uh, PW5 over the racetrack? No, that was the Krosno. That was that was your picture out the wing of Rosebud at a Krosno. Yeah, I thought it was Jan, but I took one of him too. Yeah, no, anyway, it was a thank, Krosno. Thanks for including it. Appreciate it. It's a great picture. I love it. Uh, Dave. Yes. Uh, th that last bit uh, on pressure and all that, I thought I, I I really liked that. Um, are you going to make that? those slides available? I, you know, Phil, if you would like to run this or some version of it within your program, I would more than happily work with you and give you the slides and support you and, yeah. Yeah, it was, it's more just for my own personal benefit. I didn't have time to sure. write it all down. But. What, what I'll do is let me PDF all of the slides because, you know, they're way too big to <laughs> email. Um, yes. I'll do that while Dan is, is, is regaling us with tow pilot safety and uh, try to get that into the chat before we leave today. How's that? That'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome. So we David's, given me, David's given me a 30 minutes to give this presentation. So uh, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and he'll keep track of the questions. And we'll try to answer um, as many as we can uh, at the end of the session. Does that hey, sound Dave. reasonable? Happy to do that for you, Dan. David, uh, yes, one of the things that we talked about is is the continual reevaluation of of you know what you are, what you're doing, how you're yes. doing it, and that reevaluation of a performance. Um, I think it's important to note that it's a prioritization of of the things that are required. Like it, it's a cyclical thing, but you have to prioritize. You know, if you're if you're coming in for a landing, then you know the radio doesn't matter. The it's 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 a what is the most important thing at the time to be concentrating on mm -hmm. yes i would absolutely agree with that so it becomes now a question of um and and this is exactly when we think about those accidents where people get distracted by something like a cargo door opening right so you think of the the piston twin engine you know you got that nose out there with the cargo the door opens it's flapping in front of their face and then they crash a perfectly serviceable airplane, right? Um, there was a, a report years ago out of the States, uh, a Grobe 103, so the two-seater Grobe on takeoff, the canopy opened. So the pilot who's holding the stick grabbed the canopy, right? So I got one hand on the stick, one hand on the canopy, and then they let go of the stick to pull the release. So what was the priority at that point? Fly the plane, fly the plane, fly the plane. Absolutely, right? Gliders fly perfectly well with the, with the canopy open. There's a really good video posted, and the gentleman who posted it's a professional helicopter pilot. He's flying a uh, Schweitzer 123, I think it is, and the canopy flips open on him on takeoff. He's about 50 feet above the ground. He reaches up, he closes the canopy, he holds it closed for the tow, gets to a safe altitude, right? Does the release when he's got, you know, like he's planned it, it's just not an user reaction, and then had to hold the canopy as he as he swung around and and you know landed safely, right? But he actually evaluated the situation, kept flying the plane instead of kind of letting go of the controls and and you know dealing with the distraction. Love it. Thank you so much for the dis for the conversations, Dan. Over to you. Thank you very much. So I want to talk a little bit about the tow pilot safety guide for and best practices. The idea here is this is a, um, a training document uh, for new tow pilots primarily, uh, but there may be some messages in here that uh, experienced tow pilots can use also. It is not a tow plane operations manual. So this is not the idea is that we're not replacing um, how clubs want to operate their tow planes and their manuals that they have for that. Um, to do this, we did a, uh, threat and error management uh, to do the analysis and basically uh, go through the tow plane operation through uh, from the time the tow pilot arrives for the tow plane and how his day would go until he puts the tow plane away at the end of the day after towing. Uh, and then gone back and looked at, right, what could go wrong at each of these steps going along the way. There's a little um, link right here uh, to a New Zealand uh, 
description on uh, how they do this threat and error management uh, for different facets of gliding. Uh, there's two sections. The first section is the training and curriculum, and the second section is on uh, based on lessons learned. Um, what drove us to develop this was uh, not really a, a big demand from the clubs because I, I wasn't seeing that. But when we started talking to the General Aviation Safety uh, Program group from Transport Canada, uh, we discussed this. All right, what are we doing for tow planes and, uh, and tow plane training? And each club had its own procedures and there were manuals uh, on the various websites from BGA, United States and New Zealand uh, that we used, but we felt that we would, we should sit down and, and look at our particular situation. So uh, the content is here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, the first part, which deals with glider training exercises, and I'm going to move right into best practices for tow operations. And you can see there is it, it roughly follows the sequence of the training. Uh, this document is available in our Dropbox. So I put a link at the bottom of the page and we'll put it on the uh, chat section a little bit later so that uh, if you want to have a look at the draft manual that we're working on, I'm still waiting for more feedback from the clubs uh, as the uh, CFIs and the uh, chief tow pilots digest the, the material. And it's, it's open to any tow pilot that has any comments or, or uh, um, see something missing or additions they want to put in. So pre-flight inspection, um, we talk uh, in detail about what you should be looking at at each specific aircraft. Uh, of interest maybe to glider pilots here is, the, is basically the three types of um, towing devices that we use on the tow planes. I think most glider pilots are aware with the Schweitzer hook, the top right. And then we have the uh, toast hook on the left. And we have what's called a banner, a banner flying hook on the left. And of course, the toast ring, the double ring with the small ring, uh, that's used in the toast device. And there's 10,000 cycles per, per device before they have to be overhauled. And it's important when you're hooking up a, a, to a tow plane uh, acting as a ground crew that uh, these devices are serviceable. There's not too much wear and tear on them. Um, there is a problem with the um, Schweitzer hook, if the tow plane uh, is towing and the glider gets excessively high, can put a lot of force on the, on the tow ring. And before the tow pilot runs out of elevator control, the uh, release load can go from about average of about five pounds up to 35 pounds of pull required in the tow plane. And some tow plane pilots have said that they, they could, it was jammed, they couldn't, uh, couldn't release but it will release. If they pull hard enough, it will release. Uh, there, there's some tests that have been done and they've, they've proven that uh, the release mechanism uh, will function. It can't be overloaded by the glider. Uh, down here on the bottom, um, there's possible for the ring, the large ring to flip over and get caught on the Schweitzer hook if the, uh, the rubber is worn out inside here or if they're using non-standard uh, Schweitzer rings using aftermarket product that uh, they've either uh, bought somewhere at a hardware store and it, it can lock in. We've had an incident of that. And uh, there's a section in the tow plane where we explain to the tow pilots uh, different types of tow ropes, weak link specifications, and it's an advisory circular, uh, circular glider and banner towing, AC523007. Of course, um, what glider pilots are concerned and tow pilots is density altitude and dealing with obstacles. It's important here that um, the uh, conditions of the day, the hot days, uh, high humidity, and uh, um, that, that, that density altitude can have a big, a big impact. And of course, the weight of the tow plane. So it may be required to reduce the amount of fuel in the tow plane in order to keep uh, the tows uh, able to clear the obstacles. And of course that reduces the number of tows that they can do before they have to go refueling. Glider pilots have to be patient with the, that requirement. Um, one of the things uh, also on fuel is the tanks are notoriously um, inaccurate. And the only way to know exactly how much fuel you have in the tow plane is, is to do a, a tank dipping. So you may see the pilot out there dipping the tanks to find out what his fuel requirement. The last thing you want is a um, tow plane engine quitting just uh, about 100 feet off the deck. Also uh, aircraft defects, uh, risk management. The uh, tow pilot has to 
make sure everything in his aircraft is serviceable. If there's some items that are not critical to the flight and they're not serviceable, uh, the risk may be assessed as low, but uh, you may still wish to mitigate it as a, as a tow pilot. And have to ask yourself some questions. Are you prepared to accept the risk? Are you prepared to accept the risk on behalf of your passengers or students? And the best practice is to assess the risk and ensure that the, all the crew both of both aircraft uh, are aware of what the, the risk is and it, is there an operating procedure to deal with that? Or if there isn't an operating procedure, should have a little conversation with the uh, glider pilot and say, right, what are we gonna do uh, in the event that uh, this becomes a problem for us or what procedure we're gonna use? Um, red hat policy. Uh, if you see a tow pilot wearing a red hat, you do not want to interrupt him doing his DI. Same policy glider pilots doing a daily inspection. Uh, so that's the, the concept on that. If, of course, a check item is missed or somebody interrupts you, you need to backtrack at least two check items. And if you're not sure, go right back to the start again. Uh, we talk about taxi and run up. Um, this presentation for the tow pilots takes about two hours and we whittle it down to about 30 minutes for the glider pilots, uh, what they might want to know uh, with respect to uh, the tow pilot operations. Tow planes have notoriously have limited the over the nose visibility and it's important that they do S turns uh, and that we as, uh, as ground crew do not leave objects on the ground or in the path of taxiing tow planes because of their inability to, uh, to see. And if you see a problem developing, um, you want to get a hold of them on a radio or, or give a hand signal, run over and stop them uh, so that they uh, do not have a prop strike. And then another concept is the sterile cockpit that we talk about, you know, all tow tickets, maps, uh, any other logs and things that they have in the cockpit, it needs to be stowed away so that uh, they can have uh, uh, undistracted uh, uh, take off and landings, and also uh, there's no possibility of something jamming the controls. Radio procedures, we talk about aerodrome traffic uh, radio. It's a good idea if you can do it at your club as use the same radio procedures that you would for mandatory frequencies. And uh, we recommend also that the lights be um, on, on, the, uh, on the tow plane throughout the tow operation. Uh, to provide that extra enhanced visibility, reduce the risk of uh, mid-air collisions. Uh, hand propping, you uh, should uh, not hand prop an, an airplane unless there's a pilot at the controls and the person doing the hand propping is knowledgeable on how to do it. There's been a lot of prop strike accidents from people not knowing what they're doing. And, uh, but for glider pilots, when you're around tow planes, always treat the propeller as potentially live. So if you move that propeller, it might be close to its compression stroke and ignite with the magneto as a fault on it and uh, could start the, uh, the engine or at least make it go through one compression strike uh, cycle and strike the, uh, the hand proper. Uh, another thing is that generally if there's a, a airplane needs to be hand propped and it does have an alt, uh, a, um, a starter motor, it's usually an indication of more serious uh, electrical problem and this probably that should be solved before that tow plane is used. Um, we then get into takeoff and tow. Uh, a big thing here is gliders should not be hooked up to the tow plane until the, the um, glider pilot has completed his pre-flight checks and he's ready to go. I think most of us are good at this, but there have been cases where um, they're trying to rush things along on the flight line and they hook up the glider before the, the glider pilot is, uh, is ready or they, they present the, the tow or rope for inspection uh, before the time is ready for them on the checklist. And uh, then something like canopy gets forgotten. Or uh, gliders, uh, uh, the tow plane uh, has a change of tow pilots or the tow pilots decides they're gonna taxi back to the uh, for maintenance or fuel or whatever it is, and the, the glider is hooked up and ends up being dragged. Uh, next, we'll look at the uh, giving the take up the slack. Uh, tow plane pilots were telling them that uh, they have to be very cautious about the tow plane lurching ahead, especially on a soft field. Uh, where the glider gets pulled, uh, when they're taking up the slack, the glider gets pulled ahead and creates more slack. 
And then what happens is as the all load is given, uh, the glider ends up being slingshotted, drops a wing, ground loops, or hits other aircraft that are parked around it on the field. Um, so uh, the crew and the tow pilot have to be aware that if they create a slack situation, that slack needs to be removed. And we're cautioning tow pilots to look in the rearview mirror and, and visually confirm that the, the rope is taut before they, they give the all out. Um, there is a problem that tow pilots should be aware is that firewalling the throttle to get a, a quick takeoff, especially in the soft fields, uh, can create a vortice around where the power is initially applied. And as the glider gets pulled forward into where the tow plane are initially put on the power, there, there's uh, vortices can force the wing down. So the glider pilot needs to be ready for this and anticipate it. And the tow pilot should be avoid uh, creating that vortice by bringing the power up over three or four seconds uh, as opposed to giving full power immediately. Also, uh, I've been in situations where full power is applied, uh, the tow plane lurches forward and then the, the tires bind in the soft ground and the glider is brought forward. And then as the slack comes out very quickly, uh, because they don't take up the slack again, the elasticity of the tow line creates this slingshotting effect and the gliders have lost control on the launch. Crosswinds with inexperienced students, uh, glider can be moved uh, laterally on the takeoff and moves too far to one side because of the drifting with the wind. And what this does is uh, creates a, a yaw in the tow plane and can either roll the tow plane or um, just make it such that the tow plane can't maintain a heading along the runway center line. And uh, both the, the tow plane and the glider end up drifting towards the edge of the field uh, towards obstacles. Also, it's possible to stall the rudder and then cause a, um, a, rudder, a rudder roll for the tow plane. Now this technique sometimes of moving to one side or the other to yaw the tow plane is used in Nordo situations where the glider pilots are trying to uh, steer the, the tow plane to where they want to go. And uh, some tow planes don't believe that uh, the glider can affect the tow plane that much, but I've given demonstrations to those tow pilots in the air showing that the, uh, the risks of uh, pushing the, gli the glider, pushing the tow plane into a, uh, a roll. Uh, some of the effects of uh, crosswind can be eliminated by having the tow plane slightly downwind of the glider so that when the initial takeoff roll starts, the weather caulking of the tendency to have the nose of the glider pointed, the wind is offset by the fact that the, the towing is pulling the nose slightly in the opposite direction at the beginning of the tow. Uh, David talked about this previously, the door window opening on the ground run. Um, if the, we're telling tow pilots, if you see the, the canopy open on a glider and the glider's still on the ground, just release the glider can carry on with, with the, uh, the launch without the glider, or if there's enough room for you to land on the remaining runway and move to the left, uh, do so, but abort if possible. Uh, even if the glider is a few feet in the air and there's plenty of room to land ahead on the runway, it's better if the tow pilot just aborts the, uh, the takeoff by releasing the glider. Dan? Yes. Um, would the decision to release the glider by the tow pilot be uh, taken at that moment, like for an inc incident like, a, like, a, like, a, uh, some, like what you described? or you rather leave the pilot in control of the glider to manage the situation? Because maybe for the glider pilot, it was better not to be released at that point. And he was in control of the flight and, and you, you see what I mean? Are you anticipating maybe a decision that the glider pilot should take? Yeah, there's been many, many fatal accidents with the, the glider, uh, even in passenger flights with experienced pilots. Um, the uh, sugar bush in the United States, I can remember one there, and there was another one in Texas where the glider pilot, uh, the tow pilot continues the launch. So the glider pilot is struggling with the, um, the canopy and 
he has a sympathetic reaction where he's trying to pull the canopy closed and he pulls back on the stick, pitches up, and uh, uh, didn't cause his tow plane upset, but they stalled the glider and this glider just rolled over and crashed. So we're saying is if the tow pilot notices it and it's, you can land straight ahead, release the glider and put, keep, him, keep him down on the ground. The risk of taking him up is much greater than keeping him on the ground. Of course, if there's no runway, not enough runway ahead to land safely, and uh, then uh, he has to accept that, the, the risk that he's gonna take him up and the, and the glider pot is gonna be able to maintain control. But you don't wanna release him and force him into the trees or into an obstacle at the end of the field. Uh, many canopy releases usually occur on the ground roll from the bumping around because the canopy is not locked or as soon as the glider uh, becomes airborne and there's a little bit of yaw to try to uh, stay behind the tow plane, uh, that when they're adding that crab in, the wind catches the canopy and flips it open if it's not locked. So that's, that's what we're recommending. Not everybody may agree with it, but that's what we're, we're suggesting. Um, if the brakes are not closed, uh, same thing, the tow pilot will warn the glider pilot um, that uh, the brake, the air brakes are open by saying spoiler, spoiler, spoilers, and he'll waggle, waggle the tail, not just flip the rudder, but actually move the uh, rudder back and forth a little bit so the tail actually moves. And the uh, glider pilot should close the, the air brakes. If, if they don't at that time, and the same as open canopy, if there's enough runway uh, straight ahead, or you're still on the ground, release the glider. Um, the glider should be airborne about halfway down the runway. So if the tow pilot notices the glider still on the wrong, uh, in the ground, you should uh, take a look at the air brakes. So this is, this is that situational awareness piece that we were talking about uh, before with David, that uh, the tow pilot needs to check the, the rear view mirror every now and then during the takeoff run, just to make sure that the, the flight is going. And, the idea here is we're trying to integrate the tow plane pilot as part of the safety team. So it's not just the glider pilot, not just the tow pilot, it's the ground crew, the tow, the, the, the and both pilots. Uh, uh, Dan? Yes. Uh, just a quick question, just sliding back to your previous section about uh, the tow pilot actually releasing the glider. Uh, if, he, if, he, if the tow pilot observes something going very wrong, are you saying that the tow pilot may need to make a decision um, about the efficacy of releasing a glider that's probably going to not have enough room to stop as against continuing the tow and then things get much worse if the glider pilot can't actually handle, you know, he's, 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 he's making the decision for the glider pilot who should decide for himself to release when things going downhill. Yeah, he's making a decision for both of them. And in this case, if you've got a Pawnee that's very powerful and you've got a, a glider and a density altitude and those things are not a factor. Um, and most Pawnees can pull a glider with the air brakes open uh, safely over the obstacle. And more so, then the decision would be not to release the glider. If I'm towing and I see this, uh, I give this the, the signal not to release and it's still, it's still open and there's room enough for him to land the glider uh, ahead, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll release the, uh, the glider. If I'm in the Pawnee, I'll probably tow him up around. So there's the difference if I'm a Citabria or a less powerful tow plane, I'm probably gonna release him. If I'm in a Pawnee, I'm probably gonna tow him around. And that's as long as he's got enough room to land ahead. Uh, we have a video of a, of a glider, of a tow where the, the tow plane kept towing the glider up and eventually he got to a point where the didn't think he was going to clear the obstacle. So he released the glider at uh, 300 feet. Um, well, I don't think it was 300 feet. It was much lower than that. But he, he, the, the, the drag was causing the, the tow to descend. I guess also some air currents were not favorable to the, the tow plane uh, climbing. And it was a uh, probably about a hundred feet, I think, in the video. Uh, yeah. Dave can correct me. And he released it, and the uh, the glider just immediately went into a right turn and crashed in the in the field. So Dan, I was actually going to just chime in. Um, it, it is very situational, Dave. And in that particular video, I've used it in my in my um, safety things before. The glider's a poo hatch, and it's being towed by a chipmunk. 
um, you see the spoilers clearly open fully on the initial roll, like even before he becomes airborne. He's on a very long strip. In fact, he passes a winch, uh, you know, as they roll past the end of the runway. So there was lots of time as the tow pilot, if, if he had noticed that the spoilers were fully open and they've still got 2,000 feet of runway in front of them, you know, and it's not closing, pull the release, you know, drop them down. Because if he had done that, that glider would have rolled to a stop. They'd have pushed it back, you know, oops. Instead, they destroyed the glider and put the poor guy in hospital. You know, so he continued to the tow, continued the tow, and he was barely clearing the trees. And eventually the tow pilot said, I have to let him go, right? Because it was going to be two airplanes in that crash instead of one. So it is very situational, though. And if, the, if on the ground roll, they, it was clear in the video, they're, they're past the halfway point on the field and the glider is not airborne. Uh, you know, look in the rearview mirror, we've seen the air brakes open, just release the glider right there. And not, the glider wouldn't be damaged, the pilot wouldn't be injured. So climb on did, toe. Did, did that answer Sorry. it for you, Dave? Uh, yeah, if you've got the uh, got the luxury of like a lot of runway, then you can make that call very early on, even if you're in a very underpowered tow plane, you've got time to dump the glider and, and he'll be, he's got plenty of room. I mean, as you know, with our field, we've got not a lot of room. Um, so if something does, deteriorate very rapidly as we're about to clear the uh, the end of the runway then sometimes you know you might one day have to make a decision that um, either you both crash or you release a glide and he'll crash but you you get away and at least he won't crash into you so that's always a difficult choice to make but I think it's just a question of mitigating what's going to cause the least harm at the end of the day that's my sort of input and what we're trying to do is to have the mindset in the tow plane pilot that he needs to be considering a release i'm going to talk a bit more about this for tow plane upset but one of the things that we say is practice uh when you're doing your your um, uh, pre-takeoff checks in the tow plane reach down for the release handle or reach up wherever it's uh, and just go through the motions of reaching for the handle and thinking about pulling it and then when you fly you're thinking about i'm going to release that glider i'm going to release that glider and it'll be an exception if i don't release it on the flight because everything went the way it was supposed to but what happens is where we have tow plane upsets and that's what i wanted to talk about next is that the, the tow pilot doesn't even have it in his mind that there might be a tow plane upset and when it happens it takes four or five seconds to uh, to react and that's way too long so it strikes uh, me that um, if I can just jump in, that maybe the focus is wrong. I'll, I'll say that from my perspective. It's not so much that the glider has the spoilers open and now we're assigning some responsibility to the tow pilot to detect that and make a decision. I think it has to be more about you're just not making altitude the way you think you should. And that could be due to many different factors. It could be a problem with the engine. But I yes. agree with the idea that the tow pilot um, has the right and the responsibility to make that call and should be ready to make that call. Uh, you, you hit the nail right on the head. It's, it's not so much that the, the, pilot, the tow pilot has a responsibility. Now, each pilot has a responsibility to ensure the safety of the flight. And there's a component for the tow pilot and a component for the glider pilot. And what happens is that we get complacent because we're we're towing as i'm speaking now as a tow pilot i get complacent because the toes have been going really good and we're not anticipating we're going to have any problems until all of a sudden there's one now we're caught by that deer uh, deer caught in the headlights uh, situation that uh, uh, david talks about where we we slow our reaction we've lost situational awareness we're caught by surprise and we don't react so what we need to do is to say right this is how i plan to react what I hope is that we're not going to have to, to make any of those decisions, but all along the tow, I'm monitoring the whole operation to see that it is going to wait, function the way it's supposed to go. And when it doesn't go the way it's supposed to go before I risk my life and the glider pilot's life, I can take, there's actions that I can take that will save both of us and keep us out of trouble. If I, if I can pipe in here on, and it's was mentioned in some of the chats there that we're missing here, 
is radio communications. And even though the wing walkers, they should be checking the spoilers before they get it all out and not just hand signals, but also doubling up with uh, radio communications to the pilots. I've done 15 years with the cadet gliding program and it's never been a problem. And then with the clubs here and, uh, you know, having been an air traffic controller, our communication is very good. And I have done releases, uh, even on the ground, we said, well, we have a problem issue. Uh, we're not towing right or the engine might sputter. And before you even release, you're on the radio and tell the glider pilot, I'm going to release you. So he anticipates it also. I, th I think there's not enough mention here about communication. Uh, and you have radios, so let's use them. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I, I, as I said before, as I had this presentation is two hours. If I get into every point, all I did was cherry pick a few points that I thought the glider pilot should be aware of. Uh, radio procedure is uh, and communications as vital as you say, and uh, I, I don't disagree with you. And I, I, I apologize, I can't get into the detail of everything that's in the manual, but you can download the manual and have a look at that. And if I've missed something uh, to that extent where I, I've not mentioned you think enough detail, you can give me some feedback on the manual. It would be appreciated very much. Um, uh, what I want to get into here now is this uh, this view of the tow plane. Uh, this happens sometimes. The, with the, the tow pilot launches, he gets uh, glider gets airborne, the tow plane gets airborne. Now he holds it in level flight to accelerate to the tow plane towing speed, uh, the glider's towing speed. And then immediately uh, with that extra airspeed, there's a very strong um, liftoff and it can sometimes leave the glider behind. And this gets, um, as you know, uh, is worse if there's a wind gradient and sometimes the tow pilot gets way up above the uh, glider. So what we're telling tow planes is anticipate this to be happening and don't let it happen. Try to make it a smooth gradual climb up so that the uh, glider pilot can keep up. And also um, if there's a student on the back or first solos, this is something you have to take into consideration to make sure that you don't do this rapid climb, which is possible in the tow planes like the, the Pawnee. Um, what are the problem, of course, is that if this happens and the tow glider pilot is a little bit uh, behind trying to stay with the tow plane and he tries to catch up now, all of a sudden he pitches up and you get this slingshot, uh, the slingshot effect where uh, even the glider pilot giving full forward on the control stick, he's not able to get it down. And the tow plane upset, as you can see here, it can happen in three seconds, three to four seconds, and the tug is decelerated. The nose is pointed straight down because the angle of attack is reduced to zero in the tow plane, and you're talking an 800 foot minimum need for recovery of the tow plane, uh, providing is the rope is broken or the uh, the uh, tow plane has ditched the uh, the glider. So it can happen very fast, and it's made worse by the fact that if a glider has a C A G hook. Um, so both the glider pilot has to be aware of this and the tow pilot needs to be aware if he sees a C a G hook being hooked up on the glider behind him, that glider pilot can get into trouble fast if he gets left down low. And uh, it would be um, almost impossible for him to, to regain control of the glider. So my, when I was flying, I would look in mirror over mirror and if I saw the belly of the glider, I could feel the pull and I've got to apply um, uh, I can feel it, the tail being pulled down and I look in my rear view mirror and all I see is the belly of the glider shooting up, my hands already reaching for the release and I'm going to start pulling unless I see that nose coming in behind me. I don't wait to see the nose coming back. If it, if it isn't there, when I look in the mirror again, I continue pulling until he's gone. And that's um, to save him and to save me. Uh, Dan, I've, I've been told that that split second between being able to release and surviving, or if you delay a little too long, um, can can be the end of your life. It, it, apparently that, when, when that's going really, really wrong, it, 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 that last bit can happen so fast, especially if you're only a couple of hundred feet or even less above the ground, that it, um, it, it would it, it would happen so fast that you won't actually have time to, to, to do anything about it. So um, it's probably better to release a little, uh, you know, a split second too early than too late. Yes, I, and I'm not thinking about it. I just, I, I'm just saying, when I felt my tail go down, 
I looked and I saw the glider was way down low and he was just nose was coming up. I reaching down for the handle. And as I was starting to pull, the nose was coming up like this and he would have been released in about one second, but all of a sudden the nose pitched forward. And I didn't, I didn't, I let go of the release at that time. But it, the difference at that point, as you say, is just a second or two. So how do we mitigate this? Uh, some uh, clubs have uh, specific toe patterns that they use uh, so that to try to separate uh, toe planes from uh, their um, glider traffic when they're doing their departures. So in this case, the yellow lines here is uh, departure routes for the toe planes well clear of where gliders would be coming in, where gliders are coming in back from the, uh, this area on this particular airfield. Uh, engine cooling can be a factor on hot, hot days. Sometimes uh, full power can't be used in the tow plane without keeping the engine going in the red. So you either got to stop tow operations or uh, if the glider tow planes are powerful enough, they can reduce the power uh, sufficiently to keep the engine uh, cooling and, uh, and a little bit more airspeed. Now this will reduce the height above ground level for emergencies and obstacles. So on hot, heavy days, extra caution is required by both pilots. Talk a bit about power flarm now. Uh, the key with flarm or devices, uh, we've come up with some power flarm drills. And uh, one of these things is to try to identify a visual contact with a threat before the power flarm gives you an indication that there is a problem. So I, when I fly with flarm, I'm always looking for traffic, keeping my head out of the cockpit. And if the flarm tells me of a threat before I've, I've seen it, I, it tells me my visual scan is breaking down. It happens once in a while, but uh, most often I can find a threat before the flarm will give me uh, a warning. Uh, the thing to remember is as a tow pilot, is the glider pilots, especially new pilots, if it's turbulent a bit or they're, they're fairly inexperienced, their focus is right on the tow plane, they may not have good situational awareness of, of the other traffic there. So when you're coming up to release the uh, glider, don't be surprised if they haven't seen a threat that might be on their right or near where they might be flying. And uh, it, it, it might be prudent to have a radio call with the, the glider to warn, it, warn them of another other traffic before you release them. Uh, the power flarm goes through various stages. This is the, uh, the warning display. On the uh, brick, you, it will go to a, um, sorry, this is the uh, alert uh, stage where the, the target becomes yellow, tells you there's a potential conflict uh, and roughly what direction. And then when it switches to warning, because now a collision might be uh, set up on the algorithm, uh, this one's showing at 11 o'clock, there's two threats and that they're above the horizon. Uh, the third uh, display here is for um, um, transponders that uh, don't have a GPS position uh, with them. Uh, that just shows up as a ring and uh, as the ring gets closer to you and smaller, it, it'll indicate that the uh, traffic is closing on you. And the last one in the display is the uh, obstacles that we don't have obstacles for North America. One of the things that uh, go back to David's presentation is uh, the, the mind plays a lot in what we see. And in this particular example, you're flying along, you, you get a warning on your flarm, you look up and you say, oh, okay, he's flying away from me, he's not a threat. And now you've dismissed the threat, you continue flying. But what you've forgotten is there's another aircraft and you're, because you're not looking for it, you don't see it and it's masked slightly, it's difficult, it's more difficult to see, so it's not clear in your vision. And that's what we mean by the third glider trap. Another problem with the flarm is that when you get an alarm, in this case, there's one threat, uh, and it's indicating there's no, it's not above you or below you. The pilot looks, he's been a bank turn, he looks up along his wing, and he can't find the threat. That's because the threat is relative to the horizon. So that's, you, have, you don't have to look along your wing, you need to look across. 85% of the uh, collisions occur from behind. Um, these are statistics from the BGA. 
So uh, a lot of blind spots here have a, have a big uh, role to play in not being able to see a target. And this case uh, where one airplane is flying faster than the other um, is how this situation uh, develops. If they're flying both at the same speed, uh, most of the threats that'll collide with you will be seen forward of the wings. And on descent, uh, this is an example of uh, two aircraft on final approach. And of course the blind spot is for this pilot and the above he's got to look through his engine cowling to be able to see below him. So if he flies in a straight line without making S turns or banking to have a look below him or looking for shadows on the ground, he's not going to see the fact that there's two planes on approach. Now on the uh, portable device, uh, it uh, doesn't give you the, the direction of the threat in terms, it's just the radar image. So we have an alert. So when you get an alert, have a, a look at the, where the threat is in relation to your position. And in this case, it's saying it's 300 feet above and descending. So you know that there's a conflict starting uh, with this. And this is based on the range rings that you have. Of course, this is being one nautical mile. So you know it's half a nautical mile away. And then when it switches to alarm, the threat turns red. Um, the, the thing is, is if you can't find when, the, when that, the BGA was saying, don't look at the farm. If you get the alarm, keep looking outside. It, that's not human nature. When that thing f goes from a alert to an alarm, your eyes are going to immediately look at the screen because it's going to buzz and flash. So quickly note where the thread is. Okay, off my right, and it's slightly high, and then look out the canopy and try to find the threat. If you can't find it within a few seconds and it's still giving you an alarm, what means is that your present course is going to cause a problem. So alter your present course. Uh, descending gives you the, the biggest separation, uh, the fastest, and altering your course to the right because of the rules of the road. Uh, if it's appropriate, that's the way you should turn slightly. So I alter my course to the right slightly and descend a little bit. And that gives me my, if I can't find a target, uh, at least I've created some separation. Then I've had the, the alarm go off uh, after I've done that. And I've, I may have never seen the target. I've been, ever, been able to find it. So, but I keep looking out because it might, uh, I might find it again. And of course, transponders, um, they, give us, uh, they give us an indication uh, if the tow plane uh, or the glider or other gliders are equipped with uh, transponders, as typical in U.S. contests, they've got both the flarm and the transponders. These indications are coming on all the time uh, of potential threats, especially in gaggles, because it's less accurate than the algorithm in the flarm for GPS position. Uh, some pilots shut off the audio. Don't shut the audio off. Just turn it down so that it's not as annoying, but you can still hear it. And that way you can remember to turn it up when you we leave the gaggle or the situation of where they're getting so many uh, conflicts for being reported by the, uh, the transponders. If you turn it off, many pilots will forget to turn it back on and then they, they don't get an audio response. Uh, going over time here, David, do you want me to just cut it off or should I continue with the slides? You'll have to unmute. Because I never make that mistake. Um, we're going to do another break at about the hour. So why don't you okay. finish up for about another five, six minutes? Okay. And, and there's a couple of comments in chat that we'll share as soon as you're ready. Okay. Um, warning here is don't deliberately create a flarm alarm situation in the air. It's discourteous unless you've, you've planned it and talk to both pilots and how it's going to safely be done. But it's, it's, uh, I think it's a increasing a risk for purposes of training. Um, in Europe, they say just park your aircraft near the button of the airfield off the main runway. And as the tow planes or gliders come in with their flyer units, you'll be able to train your students uh, on what, what the displays are, or look like for the warnings and alarms. Um, don't touch the antennas or let the canopy contact any of your antennas. We're having a lot of problems with static discharge and it does a lot of damage to the devices. 
So in tow plane, release and descent. The ideal release of glider is with the tow plane wings level, power slightly reduced to maintain level flight. And that's the indication that we use for most uh, situations to tell the glider, yep, yeah, we're, uh, we're at the release altitude and I'm expecting that the release is going. I'm not towing any higher at that point. A typical release is uh, the glider releases and does a turn roughly 90 degrees. The tow plane would fly ahead for a second or two and then make a turn 90 degrees to the left. And that's what we call normal procedure. Now it's possible that the glider may hit a thermal um, on the uh, departure uh, before he reaches his uh, normal planned release altitude. And if he does so, it would be uh, prudent for the glider pilot to communicate with the tow pilot and say, you know, I've released uh, at, the, at the last thermal, thanks for the tow. Tow plane should, uh, should radio for a glider position report if he can't locate the glider. So once the tow plane makes his turn, he keeps the, the drill in as the glider pilot to post uh, release drills as to to find out where the, the tow plane is and if he's uh, safely far enough away from where they're going to be planning their maneuvering. And the same with the tow pilot. Don't, don't forget about the glider just after your release and concentrate and get back to the field. Find out where the, the glider is. And if you see him thermaling and climbing, you know he's all right. If you see him sinking and coming down, then you know there's, there's going to be potential conflict later on. So. And if you can't find it at my club, the, the standard procedure was the tow pilot would ask for position report using uh, pad position altitude uh, direction of travel um, to get a confirmation of where all the glider traffic was as he was returning to the field. Um, and uh, some clubs again have the uh, tow plane descent sectors or corridors. In this particular case, you can see the gliders come down here in the letdown area and then join their circuit and tow planes are descending in their area and then joining their planned circuit. And this is different for different runways or different uh, directions for the wind blowing. Another way to do it is uh, having a sector corridor. In this particular case, the uh, for anywhere from uh, half a nautical mile to one and a half nautical miles in this quadrant is the tow plane descent sector area for the wind coming from this direction. And the gliders, of course, will be left, in, left hand downwind circuits to land. So they know that this is the area for them to avoid and the tow planes know that this is an area that they can, uh, the gliders are going to try to avoid. Um, we get into an explanation a little bit about the human visual system for the tow pilots. Um, this uh, is two degrees is our co uh, cone of visual acuity. It's a very narrow cone for uh, the human eye and we can see uh, a target out or a threat out to the 20 degree circle. And then anything beyond the 20 degrees to our peripheral vision, we see movement only. We won't detect anything. And what happens is our vision, as we get away from the center of the cone, uh, our, our ability to detect a threat on the horizon decreases substantially. And you can see here a detection range uh, in the cone of acuity is five kilometers, but it's going down rapidly so that at 20 degrees of our vision, we're down to half a kilometer or 2200, which is the definition of legal blindness. Looking at the uh, field mapped out on a graph here showing 120 degrees for left and right, we see that uh, that uh, 20 degree cone of uh, where we can actually pick out a threat beyond that to our peripheral vision we're not going to see any targets that are not moving. Of course, something not moving is something that's on a collision course with us or uh, unless that target is moving. And then we'll sense in our peripheral vision uh, the movement of that uh, threat. We have blind spots to deal with created by optic nerve or any kind of birth defects we have in our eyes. We have empty field myopia, which is the fact that we only focus out to about four to six feet if we don't have anything to focus on for about 10 to 20 seconds. And blue sky myopia where we can, um, we see things by their change in luminance. And if it's too bright or, or too blue a sky and there's too much uh, visual interference, we're not gonna notice any, uh, any of that luminance change. So we'll be blind, that's uh, mitigated with sunglasses. 
So glider pilots are fairly familiar with this, but we just want to make sure the tow pilots are. They might have learned different scanning techniques, but this is the one that we're teaching to glider pilots. And uh, it's looking out to focus at a wingtip opposite to the direction we're planning and turning. And uh, that gives us then the deals with the myopia. We look at the horizon above and below behind the wing and then roughly every 20 degrees, stop your scan so that you can focus on a point and then look above and below the horizon, then along the horizon. Once we get back to the nose, we go to the other wing tip, which is the direction we're turning and we start the scan coming back, same thing, and then check out above. And this allows us to defeat the limitations to a certain extent of, of our eyesight. As you're flying along and not doing turns, your concern, area of concern is forward of the wings along the horizon, just slightly above and below the horizon. And that'd be the area we focus most of our attention to. So descending on tow, this is a, a rare event uh, that a landing has to be made with a glider on tow. So we don't practice it. There's a procedure to follow going the low tow position, glider uh, landing first before the tow plane and uh, shallow turns, wider circuit. It can be done uh, as long as you know how to do it and you've pra you're practice in low toe flying. Uh, it shouldn't be a problem, but we don't recommend any practice of it because it's so rare. You'd have to have both weak links uh, fail. You'd have to have both uh, release mechanisms fail and you'd have to have the rope in a situation where the glider pilot couldn't break it. So the five checks would mitigate that. Circuit and landing. We want tow pilots to be aware of uh, where the hazards might be coming from. Uh, what the glider circuit looks like, the high key, low key, and uh, where they should be looking because it's possible any of those red dashed lines is where a glider could approach because if they're low, uh, they're not going to do a normal glider circuit. Rope hazards, um, glider pilots have had trailers hit, vehicles hit, people hit with tow ropes. They can dangle down 40 uh, feet below the tow plane if uh, the tow plane is approaching slow with power on. And uh, for some reason, people like to walk up forward of the wings to talk to the tow pilot for whatever reason on the flight line and with the engine running. And it's usually not when they're going up to talk to the tow pilot, but when they finish talking, they turn around and they can't see the propeller because it's invisible when it's running. And so they walk into the prop and have a prop strike. So we tell the tow pilot, anybody approaches, attempts to approach forward of the wings, you try to stop them first of all. And if they can't, they, get, they start coming up along the wing, pull the mixture off, stop the prop. Uh, aero tow retrieves. Um, pilots always want to get aero tow retrieves because they don't want to wait till dark for a recovery for their trailer. And they may put pressure on tow pilots to come and get them. Um, there's lots of hazards with doing aero trees. So the clubs have usually a lot of rules set up on uh, where uh, and when they'll allow these type of retrieves to take place. Um, it's not so much getting into the field, the problem is getting out. You can see here, this one's got lots of obstacles, especially at this end of the field, and uh, they're not a good idea. If you're doing a uh, cross-country retrieve, a continuous gentle climb is easier on the glider pilot than a hard climb and then a level cruise. The glider pilot is having problems keeping slack uh, rope out. Uh, you tow pilot could suggest that he puts his gear down uh, if it's a descent on tow, the glider may have to come up into the glider the tow plane slipstream with air brakes on to try to get a little bit of drag from the, uh, from the slipstream to help keep the rope taut. Um, one of the problems of being a recovery from another field is there may not be a wing runner present or the pilot may not be skilled enough to prevent the dragging wing from causing a ground loop on the takeoff. Uh, we do have a website that has wing uh, runner training and uh, you can have that brought up on your cell phone uh, while you're uh, in your smartphone while you're at the field and let the person who's going to run the wing go through that uh, slide package, take a few moments to get them trained up to speed. Uh, it's one thing to be told what to do, but another thing not to have seen it been done before, uh, having a, somebody in a farmer's field or the uh, the farmer or some other civilian out there trying to run your wing doesn't really know what he's doing. Uh, tow plane refueling, uh, but a lot of times the fuel neck can get damaged at the top of the uh, aircraft wing and it helps uh, 
if the uh, somebody ho takes the weight off the hose while you're refueling. So if you see the tow plane heading to the fuel track, you should send somebody from the field to help the tow pilot refuel. Okay, and that's uh, just a sort of summary of the points that I thought that glider pilots might need to know from the, the tow plane uh, safety manual. Thank you, Dan. You, you've sparked a lot of conversation in the chat and, and I took an important element out of this is that I should be wearing a red hat. <laughs> um, so uh, Roger commented, glider pilots should always know where the tow plane is, especially when, you know, returning to the field. It's part of that situational awareness. Good comment, Roger. Um, Drew asked, um, I've often thought about the tow plane should use a glider transponder code to advise other paradigm glider activity in the area. Uh, I understand TC does not agree, and he would like your comment on that. Yeah, that's, uh, I can see the, the rules are, is if it's a glider, then it squawks the 1200 code. If it's a, a powered airplane, it squawks the 1000 code. Uh, normal, uh, normally the um, tow plane operations at the field, they inform air traffic control. And if they have a nearby aerodrome that requires uh, notification or just as a courtesy, they let them know that they're doing towing operations. So they'll see the two codes and they'll, the controllers can figure it out. Okay. Um, what we do at our club actually, because we're underneath the Tursa for Toronto is we'll actually call um, air traffic control and get a discrete code so that they know we're operating. And, and I think that's a good practice to have as well. Um, there's a couple of comments around the glider alerting the tow pilot of, um, of uh, traffic. And as, as some people chimed in, four eyes are better than two. Um, and then the last one was around, oh, where did it go now? That spoilers are difficult to see. So as a tow pilot, often very difficult to see spoilers are open, which a couple of people agreed with. Uh, one comment back though was you can feel the symptoms. So if you're not getting the acceleration, if you're not getting the climb out, if you're getting the light takeoff, that type of thing. Uh, yeah, but along I think, with Along with feeling the symptoms, uh, we're trying to also teach the tow pilots that if they feel the, the uh, what they think is the release, um, not to assume that the glider is off the tow rope, to have a look and, and visually see that the tow ro rope is free from the glider before they commence their turn. Mm -hmm. So it's cars the opposite side of that coin. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, it is 3.08, so we are due for our... Um, break. So let's do a seven minute break here. We'll be back at, um, actually, let's make it a five minute break at 3.13. We'll see you back here at 3.13. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Thank you. Dan, what are your thoughts on a low toe position like they do in Australia as opposed to the standard of what you do here? Um, the Australians have, uh, from what I understand, have abandoned the low toe position. That was their policy for a long, long time, and they've gone to the high toe now. Um, I, that's my understanding. Maybe some clubs are still staying with the low toe position. Both both are fine, but the uh, the issue is with the toe plane upset. So you you can things can go south even quicker with the low toe position um, lagging more behind and and pulling the toe plane down. I didn't say there in my presentation. One of the things we say if if you are in a toe plane and you have to give full stick back and you hit the stop. Uh, then you release the glider. That's another, uh, that's another indication he's raising your tail too fast. If you, if you require a full elevator, then it's, you're at a point where uh, you have to release the glider. You can't wait. Does that answer your question enough? Okie doke. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, related question. Uh, I read somewhere in some some SAC training material about uh, you know as a glider pilot uh, that when you're about to release, say something like rope away. Now I think that was an implication to, to say it out loud to yourself or something like that. But I've taken the practice now that when uh, I'm on tow and I release, I literally just get on the radio and say you know rope away. So the tow pilot knows that I've done that. Uh, what do you think of that practice? 
Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, some some clubs are really strict on their radio procedures. I know when I was in Lasham, the only time I was allowed to talk on the radio was when I said I was downwind. And then I wasn't supposed to say anything else again. And uh, unfortunately, that uh, because they've got so many aircraft in the circuit, uh, I've, been, I've been in a circuit with 21 gliders coming in for a landing. And uh, you have to keep the radio, the the rate of traffic to a minimum. So um, that'll depends a lot on the club SOPs, but if you are if you can do more radio communications, you can do this uh, and, and properly, uh, the safer I think the operation will be. So that, that's my opinion on it. Um, and Rope Gone, Rope Gone is in the, is part of the way we're teaching the instructors now is have your students say Rope Gone out loud during, the, during their training, they may, that way they're always conscious of it later on when they're flying solo they'll be they'll be always because they've said it they're going to always be looking to see that the rope is gone before they turn away in fact in fact that's right that's where i saw that material and then i just took the habit of saying well i might as well inform well it's, it's for me since i'm going to say it out loud i might as well let the, the tow pilot know at the same time yeah it's and that's what we're we're saying in the tow pilot thing the the uh, manual is that the glider pilot should tell you when he's released um, if it's not at the normal release point by saying rope you know I've released uh, thanks for the tow that's kind of a typical uh, response that you get from the glider pilot and it doesn't hurt to do it uh, providing you don't have the congestion on the radio uh, at any time you get a release so you get a positive indication that you're released just give practice. everyone just give everyone a quick one minute heads up we'll be back to restarting at one minute so if you need a refill on your coffee now's the time <laughs> I was just going to pipe in that uh, over the winter I had the opportunity to do the uh, multi uh, crew uh, ground school and, oh, nice. uh, it was really an amazing course uh, and uh, you know, strangely enough, it seems very relevant to what we're doing here of, uh, you know, tow pilot, glider pilot operating as a multi-crew team uh, I, coming through quite strong. Robert, I would, I would love to chat with you at greater length on that. Where did you do that? Uh, International Pilot Academy in Gatineau. Okay. Uh, they're, now, uh, they're now a full ATPL program. And uh, I teach the PPL ground school. So I got a chance to, uh, to sit in and critique the first uh, uh, pass through the PPL or the uh, multi-crew course. So it was really worthwhile. I'm, I'm going to uh, pop my email into the chat for you, Robert. I can okay. connect later on that because it's, sure, uh, yeah, it's an area that I wanted to investigate a little bit further. That's a good point because we we're trying to push the tow pilot operations rather than being a, a one, two separate things from the glider flying and the, the tow pilot flying is that it is a crew resource management issue. And they need to think of themselves as a crew where they work together, the as the point was raised earlier, they're communicating together and that they're resolving uh, issues on the radio. Uh, too many, we've had too many accidents where just a simple conversation between the two pilots to sort something out would have prevented an accident. And I'm a big one for briefing, uh, briefing the ground crew and the glider pilot on tow operations, if anything's going to be out of the normal, mm -hmm. especially, especially for training. Oh. There we go. I just got to get my screens rearranged. Every time you change something in Zoom, it rearranges your screens on you. So even if I didn't uh, need to take a washroom break, I stood up and moved around a little bit. Uh, these Zoom sessions that can go on for hours, uh, f I find a good to plan. Avoid having a blood clot. Good plan. All righty. I think we've we've covered off enough of the or uh, the um, uh, the elements in the chat. So oh dear, I went to the wrong place. Um, there we go. Um, so I'm going to continue ahead, and we are at 3:15, so we got about another 45 minutes. Um, thank you so much, Dan. Um, as you can see, Dan does a, a wonderful job of really digging into the details. And I know you're you're very rushed through that. Um, while the actual session's three hours, I think it could be probably closer to more like a day. There's, there's definitely a lot, a lot of material there. 
Um, we're going to kind of shift gears back into our situational awareness piece. And um, we talked a little bit about what are some of the factors that affect our situational awareness and, and health came up very prominently. So do you have enough sleep? Are you properly rested? Uh, have you had proper wa food, proper water? And, and you know, all that's part of the um, I am safe checklist. But our brain, as I like to say, runs on three things, sleep, food, and water. And of course, every time I say that to a pilot, they always add in their oxygen because uh, as pilots, we get up into the zones where we get into the thin air that uh, you know those terrestrial beings don't have to worry about as much. But our brain also runs on stress or, or the good stress. And we've already introduced you to the chart of as we increase our stress, we, we increase our, our performance. Um, some really good comments in the chat around that as well. But what I want to do now is dig into stress a little bit more from a slightly different angle and talk a little bit about acute stress versus chronic stress. Now, our fear response is designed for immediate and visible threats. And this has served us very well through our evolution as we were facing, you know, tigers and lions as we're out on the plains. This is a great example of acute stress, something that is immediate and visible. It's also something short-lived. This is going to, you know, wrap itself up relatively quickly, like within a few minutes, if not an hour or two. What we're not really well designed for is that chronic stress. So to Dan's point around sitting on these Zoom calls for hours on end, <laughs> and as we wrestle with finances and career development and, and you know, long-term even to the point of multi-generational as we think about our children and our, our grandchildren and, you know, are, are we putting, you know, enough savings aside to, to go into our retirement and, you know, these types of things. And this is where we really start to run into some difficulty. So I was doing my research for this program and I went and talked to a doctor. So I was having a chat with my, my friend who's a doc, who happens to be a doctor and we were emailing back and forth and, and I asked him about you know, acute stress versus chronic and here was his reply. Acute stress gets your heart rate up. Chronic stress just stops it. And everything I researched on this says, you know what, acute stress, which is that short term, it's gonna, it's gonna you know, raise your performance. Chronic stress, it's, it's not good. So here's how acute stress is designed to work. There's a response, it's a quick response. So we get things like adrenaline and cortisol and, and norepinephrine flowing. Our amygdala, which is our radar of our, our fight flight response, it alerts our, our hypothalamus. That steps in front of our higher level function. So when we think of the cerebral cortex, the, the neocortex, that, that higher level uh, thinking piece, but it's designed as an immediate quick response it's not designed for long-term because we need a period of rest and recovery in between. We respond to acute stress. We go into flee, we go into fight flight mode. We go into freeze mode. Those are designed for that immediate, immediate visible threat for dealing with the saber toothed tiger on the savannah. So when we get into chronic stress, long-term activation of our stress system will give us overexposure to cortisol and other stress hormones that can disrupt almost all of your body's processes. Um, so this is out of a paper released by the Mayo Clinic. They did some research around this and the paper longer later goes on to saying it puts in risk many health problems, including, and as we take a look at this list here, anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problems, weight gain, memory concentration impairment, I want you to think about, do you want the pilot of your airplane to have to be wrestling with these? And this is what happens when we get into that whole chronic stress portion. And especially the one that really gets in that last one, the memory and concentration impairment. That's where we're gonna you know, spend a little bit of time today. And Doug just chimed in rampant in modern society and Doug could not agree with you more, right? We are in a state of constant stress and it has really gone from a, acute to chronic. And especially if we think about the last year that we've had, just over a year ago, we had a 14 day lockdown and we kind of really haven't emerged from that yet. We are not designed for chronic stress in, in, in plain and simple terms. We're just, we're, we're just not built for it. This is why we take vacation. This is why um, militaries give you shore leave. And they actually use about a six month window there because they've found in their research 
that six months is about the, the time frame where you need to have that break. So this really leads us into some of the human factors. And I'm going to, um, through the courtesy of Juicing, a company I work with has, has lent us some of the materials for this program. There is an epidemic today, and we've seen this for quite some time, of people who are highly engaged but exhausted. And what happens when you're highly engaged but exhausted? Well, if we take a look at our brain, it's about 2% of our body weight, but it consumes a whopping 20% of your metabolic energy. So metabolically speaking, this is one of the most energy hungry um, organs in your body. When we are depleted, we lose two things. We lose access to our executive function. We lose access to our social intelligence. And the easiest way to describe this is late afternoon brain fog. So here we are at about 3.30. Many of us are getting that kind of foggy brain syndrome, right? It's, it's kind of late. We're getting a little bit tired. I would like you to please describe to me what does late afternoon brain fog look like? Now, where's my code? Hold on a second here. Let me find the, Let me get the code up because there's a new code. Unfortunately, I had to use two different um, two different sessions. So pop into menti.com. The new code is five zero one zero one nine nine two. So the new code is five zero one zero one nine nine two. And I would like you to describe what does late afternoon brain fog look like? What are the symptoms? How do you know you're getting into that foggy brain situation? <laughs> Martini time. I like it. Whoever wrote that in, I think we need to go have a, have a social distance meeting. Ooh, myopia. I'd love to hear more about that. I want an app. So you actually feel physically tired. Absolutely. Love this, this one here. Inability to concentrate eyes getting heavy, um, harder to focus, less interest in the details, right? difficulty concentrating, fuzzy, sleepy. Oh, I love it. Afternoon sleep on the couch, definitely a great way to deal with late afternoon brain fog. But my question is, what are the, what are the symptoms? Overwhelming desire to nap. I love that overwhelming description. Fuzzy thinking, mind wanders. So we have difficulty concentrating and focusing. Can't focus on anything. I can't maintain focus for long. Start thinking about how to cook barbecue for dinner. <laughs> Love it. Uh, switching without execution. Um, I, I'm thinking you're switching from one thing to the other without actually executing on the first one. Would love to hear a little bit more about that. Look at the clock after one hour, but it's only been five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So we lose our sense of time. Yeah. Inability to care. Wandering brain. Love it. Making mistakes. Love it less outgoing, yeah, dozing off, junk food. Okay, you lose two things. You lose access to your executive function, you lose access to your social intelligence. Your executive function regulates your uh, focus. It regulates your emotions. It helps you concentrate. It's where all your future-based thinking is. Has anyone noticed that when you get into a good, like really serious case of late afternoon brain fog, you actually, it may, it's hard to talk. You have difficulty finding the words. What's happening is much like frostbite, where we start to sacrifice the fingers and toes, the extremities to preserve the core, we're doing the exact same thing with our brains. Now, if we look at the structure of the human brain, we effectively have three brains. We've got our brain stem, which is our core. It's the heartbeat and respiration and basic functions that just simply keep you alive. Then you've got your midbrain, which is your limbic system. This is your emotional brain. This is where we scan for cues and clues. This is where we have our fear response. And then finally, we have our neocortex, the outer portion, which is where our executive function is. And this is where we get the ability to concentrate, the ability to focus, the ability to process and think. So when we get into that late afternoon brain fog, we lose the ability to focus our attention, regulate our emotion, connect the dots. If you notice sometimes you get a little reactionary, you get a little grumpy right? Um, also to predict outcomes. Now, let's think about um, road rage for a moment. You've got someone who's running late. They're trying to get somewhere. They're, they're potentially weaving, weaving in and out of traffic. They get annoyed at someone who cuts them off, and they do the absolute worst thing they possibly could 
in terms of trying to get to their destination, they purposefully cause an accident. Now, this is what we're talking about when we talk about predicting outcomes. So my cause and effect, I start to lose some of that. The social brain, this is the one that scans for cues, it reads intentions, it feels what other people feel, it produces hunches. When we um, you know, connect with fellow humans, you're in, you're in a meeting room, you know, the mood's pretty light, you know, the boss walks in and they're just in a foul mood and you just feel the, the mood in the room change. That is your limbic system at work. It's an open loop system. And what it does is it connects us for the rest of our team to the rest of our tribe. Now, all of this releases hormones. And energy that we get from those hormones is what fuels performance. Engagement is what drives effort, but it's the energy that fuels that performance. So we, we, we met uh, my, 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 my doctor friend, a doctor. This is one of my pilot friends. I'm going to call him a glider pilot. And, you know, he's got the talent. He's got the experience. He's got the education. He's got the work ethic. He's got the intel, uh, intellect. We're expecting performance out of him, yeah? But let's put him into a really challenging situation. Unresolved team, uh, a club tension. Unrealistic expectations. He's being micromanaged. Every little thing he does is wrong. He's feeling unrecognized. He's overwhelmed as he's learning to fly. How's his performance? What do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, it's going to be a big old thumbs down, isn't it? Because what's happening is uh, my pilot friend here, he's being divided by interference. So I'm going to ask you, what causes interference for you? What gets in your way? What's rattling around in your brain as you're trying to say, you know what? I'm here to focus on this task, but that friggin' Dan Cook, he's annoyed me again, and I just ah, I can't get it out of my head. What rattles around in your brain and causes you interference? Oh, love that first one, work obligations. So just put in a word or a phrase. We're going to do a, a, a um, there we go. We're going to do a word cloud on this one. Nice. Ooh, family in there. Work obligations. I'm, I'm wondering how music causes interference. That's an interesting one. Mask. Oh, love that one. Stupidity. Yeah, that can just be annoying, eh? Um, expected at home mm, yeah so that whole you know what i got to get home by four thing right fear of judgment remember we were talking about the judgment earlier yeah covid frustrations absolutely lack of sleep notice work is really maintaining in the center there yeah family money fear of judgment frustration flarm beeping <laughs> like that one Fear of failure, noise. Yeah, noise can be an interesting one. Um, last year, we, we have a case fix at our club and we, uh, we, we installed a, um, uh, what they call that sport canopy, you know, the open cockpit. So the noise, the mask, anti-maskers. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, some good, some good things here. You notice that work and family and money and judgment are all staying pretty big in the center. That's really interesting. Okay. Let's let's pop uh, our friend our friend A pilot into a better situation. We're connecting with his passion. We've got that right sweet spot of autonomy and independence. He's he's able to do what he wants to do, and he's, he can get out there. But he's getting the support he needs. He's being recognized in meaningful ways. He's connecting with his club and with the SAC community on 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 a, a larger level. So we're now multiplying them by energy. What are some of the things that energize you? Fun. Oh, nice. Love it. Yes. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about Red Bull and coffee in a moment. Let's let, let's let a few roll in here. Notice that challenge popped in and challenge is actually being pretty big. Absolutely, people love a challenge. Uh, I'm guessing the vario when it's beeping in the right direction, flying, right, praise, absolutely, right? Because we want that challenge. We want to know that we've done that good job, right? Lift, of course, of course, recognition, praise, recognition, challenge, lift, right? Meeting those objectives. 
Constructive criticism. Oh, talk to me a little bit about that one, constructive criticism. If you're doing something wrong, instead of just being told, oh, you're doing that wrong, mm -hmm. finish the statement and guide me through on making corrective uh, actions. Love it. Yeah. So when we think about, and I'm going to put that, um, and thank you, Dino, I put that in the context of some of the words we're seeing, a challenge, recognition, encouragement, success, right? If we just say, you're doing it wrong, grumble, grumble, grumble. Okay, well, that's not very energizing, is it? But hey, it's like, you know, you're, you're doing it wrong. Let me help you learn the right way to do it so that you can learn and grow and actually, you know, be more, more of that contributing member, right? Um, love it. Oh, 10 knot thermal. Okay, yeah, that one should be bigger. <laughs> now, I want to talk a little bit about the whole Red Bull coffee piece. Um, caffeine will help you on the short term, but on the longer term, it will not. And you will have, while well, you may have a short high, you're going to have a crash on the other side. And it's, it's honestly, it's within a couple hours. It's not, this is not a good long-term strategy. So when we put all of this into a long-term, short-term, so the acute versus the chronic, um, it is, you know, That'll get us through the day. That'll get us through the afternoon. But if you're constantly doing that, you're actually setting yourself up for something much, much worse. Um, so if you do find that you're having to over rely on, on some of those, those items, love it. Um, no surprise that flying is a big one. And in, 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 this, in this group, it's right there dead center. Um, it it's, is one that very much, you know, this is why we do this. And it is an energizing, it is a fun thing. We need to make sure that we keep it that way so that we don't get into that situation where we're, we're actually turning this into a job or turning this into something that, that actually is, is de-energizing versus being energizing. And as, as uh, leaders within our clubs, as, as just heck even as humans, I want you to think about how are you interacting with your fellow pilots and your fellow club members? Is it, is it energizing them or is it more of a depleting? So we think about some of those words around what's energizing folks. I'm just going to back up real quick here. And we think about some of the things that are de-energizing, you know, around judgments, expectation, noise, that sort of thing. Um, how, can we, how can we transition what we're doing so that we're actually being, you know, that energizing force? Because we do have a sphere of influence around us. Now, just before I move on to the next piece, a um, couple items in chat. Uh, Dave chimed in, caffeine stimulates the bladder. Yes. Caffeine is a diuretic. Um, it will actually dehydrate you. So if you are getting into that long, hot day and you're like feeling a little bit tired, caffeine's not really that great of a choice. Um, uh, the other one came in from Dave. Uh, fear of looking foolish is often stronger than the fear of death. And that is an extremely strong statement, Dave, but I would totally agree with you. Um, we have part of our fear response, part of our survival instinct is to connect with our team. We did not become the apex um, you know, creatures on this planet. We did not come to dominate this planet without working in teams. Um, if you look at early man, before pre-Stone Age, pre-tools, hunters used to take down a mastodon. This is a creature the size of an elephant. And without tools, without knives and spears and guns, tribes of, of humans would take them down by working as a team, by working in, in a group. Um, it, is, it is really core to our survival instinct. This is why words like, you know, voted off the island or you're outside of the loop are just, are just so difficult for us. Uh, Robert just chimed in, hydration is extremely important, totally agree. Uh, I find at my club, we have a campground, bunkhouse, proportionally not well used. After the factors. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice comment there, Steve. Um, he says we've got a, you know, a, a, a campground, clubhouse, uh, bunkhouse. It's, you know, but they are proportionally used, not well used. They're used mostly after the fact. Rest used out of necessity slash alcohol, rather than arriving night before. Yeah, so having that good, you know, having that good well rested day, right? Um, love it. Uh, fear of looking foolish probably strengthens you as you become regarded as an expert. There's, there's some of that too, isn't there? All right. Love it. Thank you all for your comments. And, and uh, So let's finish out this performance equation. 
every pilot is multiplied by energy. So what energizes you is actually going to increase and enhance your performance. But at the same time, you're also divided by that interference. So let's think about how we can, for ourselves, remove some of that interference and drive some of that um, energy or, or some of that, uh, you know, what energizes us. Uh, Dino just chimed in. Uh, he drives three hours to the club, always the night before. Hate driving and flying on the same day. Nice. Yeah, love it. So to summarize this, <clears throat> awareness. There's situational awareness, but there's also self-awareness. Aware, you know, having that, that real clear picture of where are we on that day. Now, while we may have the skill, we may have the training, we may have the expertise and experience, is the interference kicking in? And I think one of the best descriptions for, for um, the pandemic that we're in is that we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Some of us are retired, uh, you know, well off financially. You're like, yep, no big deal. I'm, what, I just go to the airfield, I fly, I'm good. Others are dealing with loss of job. Others are dealing with overwork. Uh, for me personally, I have just had a crazy year of heavy, heavy, heavy workload. And honestly, I could use some of those energizing elements right now. Um, so, you know, have that clear awareness of your situation, clear awareness of yourself. <clears throat> um, what are some of the tools? How can we reduce or focus that workload? And finally, health. Leverage stress, reduce the pressure, fuel the engine. My mentee stopped. Does anyone else have the code? We're, we're not in mentee at the moment, Pavan. Um, we should be looking at a slide around, oh, you know what? Did I forget to share my screen? Am I sharing my screen? Just want to do a quick check. Yes, you are. Okay, good. So there was a comment in the chat around, um, yep, okay, good, thank you. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about airmanship. We're going to finish up our session today with a short conversation around airmanship and what that looks like. And want to uh, give us a little bit of time to have a bit of a discussion around what we can do to improve safety. So how would you define airmanship? <clears throat> I love the professional approach comment. Your personal approach to safety. Yep, absolutely. Professionalism. Preparation. Professionalism. Seeing professionalism quite a bit. Seeing good stick and rudder skills. Um, yeah, so we got we got a, a mix of being, you know, a professional approach, preparation, the art of flying. Using superior judgment to avoid having to use superior skills. I love that quote. That's an awesome one. Thinking of others. So part of our airmanship piece is thinking of others as well as ourselves. So it's not just us. You know, if we have an accident or an incident, are we taking someone else out? You know, a uh, great conversation with Dan's session around, as a glider pilot, I have a responsibility to the tow pilot, you know, because I could easily flip him upside down or her upside down, uh, you know, in a few seconds, right? I love this, this comment from Tony. Um, it's our sport, but you still have to be professional. Love that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so having some coolness, uh, knowing your limits and the aircraft limits. Love that one. Absolutely. Uh, being situationally aware, following those best practices, professionalism in flying and seeking to constantly approve, right? Regard for the rules. Um, you know, you never finish learning. Yeah, big fan of that. Big fan of that. One of the, the best pilots I ever knew, uh, he's now retired, I remember interviewing him, and he was like, you know, I never got it perfect. He says, I was always working on it. Um, love those, thank you. So as we think about professionalism, it's really all about reducing the risk. And when we, you know, say that airmanship is all about being professional, let's take a look at the benchmark of commercial aviation. And this was a, out of an article, um, and I'll have the reference in just a moment. But the benchmark of, of commercial aviation, extremely safe. There's about one death per million hours. Like that's pretty impressive. It's very impressive. 
Contrarily, gliders, we're looking at about one death in every 50,000 hours. And this is based on data out of Germany and France, which is somewhere about 60% of the world's um, data for when it comes to flying. Um, now, when, what he did in this article, and this is chess in the air, you've probably seen this, is he plotted, what is it like to go in an airliner? How safe is that versus driving your car, skiing, riding a bicycle, cross-country skiing, riding a horse, scuba diving, et cetera, et cetera. And while driving your car is safer um, than flying a, a private plane or a glider, it is definitely not as safe as the as the um, as the airliner. So that old expression of you know the, the most dangerous part of a of a flight is the drive to the airport. That's true when when you know you're in an airliner, but not so much when you're in a private plane or a glider. And then of course there is the ridiculously un, insanely dangerous, which is base jumping, which is about one death in 21 hours. So um, I just decided I'm not taking up base jumping. Okay. The thing here though is, as he continued on his research, about 90% of the accidents are avoidable. So we think about a number of different things we can do, like keeping temptation as low as possible, understanding why experience uh, will work against you, you know, pre-planning difficult situations, having specific emergency plans, uh, you know, uh, defined, worry a little bit. And that's that whole, you know, we need to increase the stress level a little bit, staying humble, seeking criticism. I'd love you to chime in and say, what do you think would be the biggest impact? So I've chosen six of the items that I think are kind of at the top of the list here. And I'd love you to vote, which do you think is, is going to give the greatest impact? And you get to do multiple votes on this, so you, you get to rank order the whole thing. I'm hoping these are difficult decisions for you to, to make those choices. Emergency plan for each takeoff and pre-planned difficult decisions. Those are kind of jumping around a little bit there, I'm liking this. Never skip a checklist, staying humble, worry a little bit, reducing temptations, I'm liking this. Give it a few more moments, We've got about 73 who have chimed in. The pre-plan and the emergency plan, they're just, they keep switching positions third and fourth. It's cool, okay. So it looks like this, this team's viewpoint is never skip a checklist, stay humble, those are your top two. Um, Pre-planning the difficult decisions and, and emergency plan for each takeoff is, is tied at third and fourth. Worry a little bit and then reducing temptations kind of comes down at the end. So I chose those six because as I read through the list, I was kind of looking at the list and thinking, what are the things that really spoke to me? And I, I chose those six. Now, I'd love to hear, we've now, we've got an idea of what is most important, what do you do? This is a bit of a tough one because I, I I purposely limited it to one because I didn't want you know you to go and pick all six right because give it given the the push comes to shove which is the one that you're going to choose Chris you unmuted what are you thinking uh, just yeah I wonder if I 
30 seconds for a quick story while everyone's voting. Please do. So when I was in, uh, in cadets, we had a presentation from a fellow named Ricardo Traven. He's the uh, Boeing's chief test pilot at the time on the F-18 and currently on the, the Dreamliner and some other things. Um, and we asked him during his presentation, have you ever had to eject? I mean, F-18 pilot, you know, it's kind of where everyone goes. And he said, I've never had to, but I've already decided that I will. So his whole point was to the pre-planning difficult decisions. He's made the decision that he's going to eject from the airplane. He's just waiting for the circumstances to present that decision. Love it. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good way of looking at it. Um, it it's making me think about that video we referenced earlier of the toe of the glider whose whose spoilers came open on on the toe, and he ended up crashing in the trees. Um, in England, they teach that you have your hand on the release knob for the, for the takeoff. Um, when I shared this video here in Canada through the FTSC and, and the safety officer folks, a professional helicopter military pilot chimed in and he said, I never put my hand on a control unless I intend to use it. And his point was, his take on this was, here's a pilot who put his hand on a control, in this case, the release, with no intention of using it. And as I'm, as I'm thinking about what Chris has just said, that pilot's already made the decision they are going to eject. It's now just a question of when. So there's an intentionality there. And this is something that, that kind of really bubbled to the surface for me a couple of years ago around bailing out. Many of us wear parachutes. I, I wear parachutes for every single one of my flights, both dual and single. And a couple of years ago, I got to thinking about how do I bail out? So I rehearsed that in my mind, but I've already made the decision that I will bail out. And it's just, as Chris says, a question of, you know, when and, you know, the circumstances. Um, but I did recognize that I'm actually a little deficient on that, which is I've never actually practiced the whole, you know, roll out of the canopy or roll out of the cockpit. Um, I usually just, you know, undo the straps and get out normally. So um, I decided at the end of two seasons ago that my next season, I'm going to practice doing an actual bailout, not, not in the air, but on the ground. Um, Cause the, when the, um, um, ah, the can, the Pan Am games, the Pan Am gliding play club uh, competition came to Sosa. You had to demonstrate bailing out of your airplane as part of the, before you, you were allowed to fly in the competition. And I thought, you know, I've never actually tried that. So they put a mattress down beside the glider and you would have to literally bail out. Um, so love that, never check a, uh, skip a checklist. And I see that pre-planning the difficult situations, stay humble and emergency takeoff plans are, are kind of running a close second uh, fairly in there. But thank you, Chris. That was a, I really like that, that addition. Uh, Dave, one of my anticipation rules uh, is, that, uh, is that when I'm going cross country, I'm saying to myself, I'm going to be landing out today. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, in my long history across country, I've landed out 102 times. Nice. But that's about once every 40 hours of flying. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I remember my very first cross country. I, I, I took that advice because I was given similar advice, Tony. It's like, leave the field and, and, and plan not to come back. Right. So I made sure I had all my ducks in a row. The trailer was ready. The car was ready. I was ready. And, you know, I headed out and I just, I turned my back on the field and said, this is it. I'm going to be landing over there somewhere. Fortunately, I made it to the destination and, and got my badge. But um, yeah, absolutely. You're dangerous if you think you're going to get back. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Love it. One of our, one of our AME members uh, taught us about uh, approaching the walk around in that same way. He said, I expect something to be wrong with this aircraft and it's my job now to find it. Yeah, love it. Thank you, Guy. I'd be happy if they don't. Yeah, love it. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. 90% um, of accidents are avoidable. So pre-planning those difficult situations, worry a little bit, stay humble, critique yourself, plan for those emergency situations, and of course, speak up. We can do this. We just have to work at it. And... I brought this into the safety conversation some years back about on being wrong because mistakes are inevitable and we don't make mistakes because we're bad people or because we're dumb or because we're irresponsible or thoughtless. We make mistakes because we're human, but we need to focus on the systems and not on the people. 
So when we think about, you know, what happens when we are wrong, if we want to do effective safety practices, we want to look for leading indicators, we want to do behavior-based reinforcement, uh, near misreporting, but be a safety coach, not a safety police officer. Right? So this isn't punitive, this is about growth and learning. In your word cloud, when I asked you what is energizing, growth and learning was, was very, very much at the heart of that. Okay. Um, so Eve has just chimed in on the chat, which is a, a really powerful statement here. Um, can you unmute and just give us a quick 30 second on that? Hi there, can you see me now? Yes, we can. Good. Um, yeah, I was involved in a very interesting incident where uh, during season checks, uh, a licensed pilot I was having difficulty doing the boxing the wake and, and you know, not wanting to sail them. We, I redid the maneuver and then, okay, got it, you know, it became a learning. And then anyway, short story long, this, this, this licensed pilot started doing the maneuver, went forward in a very, very, um, very vigorous forward dive. And we managed to get the tow rope wrapped around the wing. So, oh my, yeah, I managed to release, uh, however, uh, the tow rope, basically my end was 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 released and of course i couldn't i couldn't tell the tow the tow plane to release because this is a new glider and the push to talk was on the on the instrument panel not on the not on the control column so i watched the the line go through and i said hmm, this will be interesting so the so picture <laughs> this the um uh the tow plane sorry the the tow rope has been released from the the, the nose of the glider and it's now snaking back on the top of the wing. And then the, the, the tow rope is then looped underneath the wing and goes up to the glider where it's still attached. And I'm watching, I'm watching this tow rope snake and it actually got snagged between the inboard side of the aileron and the wing. So I'm now watching this go through the, through the aileron. I go, well, you know, if that aileron bust is a good chance we're gliding. And I noticed, well, we're over the river, so it's the idea of, you know, we were certainly high enough, and I want to make sure that we, we would not, uh, we would not uh, land in the water. However, as uh, as it happened, the uh, the tow rope cut through about half of the aileron, and then and then during this point is very interesting. Now you imagine the aircraft is being towed by the uh, towed by the outboard third of the wing, which. Uh, caused a very uh, rapid and exciting wing over at which point the, the rope broke. And uh, thank God the Germans make good solid gliders because <laughs> it hung together. But I would tell you, it was, a, it was a pan and it was a very gentle return and a nice 180 to the landing. And uh, maybe I'll send Dan some horror pictures of, uh, of uh, I saw the pictures of the, uh, the, the tow rope embedded in the, uh, in the aileron. Mm. But, yeah, I'd be interested to see that. That's, yeah. yeah. And, you know, as I was going through my mind, uh, you know, you know, the old time slows down. It was it was pilot decision making in very slow time. Well, mm -hmm. it was very rapidly, but it was uh, it was OK. This is what's happening. I've done all I can do. OK, either that thing's going to break or it's not. But I'm really glad we're wearing parachutes. So. Nice. Thank you for sharing that story. Well, pleasure. OK. Let's continue on. Um, so we want to think about the leading indicators. So what are those things that we can get out of, in, in front of? And in practice, um, behavior-based reinforcement systems. So this includes things like the Senior Sky Commander Award that we have at our club, which we commonly refer to as the Toilet Seat Award. And this is an award we give for anyone who, um, they make a mistake, but then they interrupt the chain and they, they break the, the chain of events and, and actually you know, bring it forward. So it's about recognizing and rewarding that, that, that behavior. Now, I recognize that we're approaching the end of our time. So I'm gonna skip over my, a couple of my, my polls. Um, a quick note on briefings. Um, I got the chance to fly with Ostiv a couple summers ago. And one of the things that really impressed me is the level at which they do briefings when we flew together. Um, and you know, we, we should be doing pre-flight pre briefings both for ourselves as well as our crew. But you should also be doing a pre-season briefing. <clears throat> so again, I'm going to just step past this poll. 
uh, got into a conversation with a, a airline pilot one time who told me the story about flying with a friend of his. Uh, the friend was PPL, newly IFR rated, never flown into clouds. And he was the, the other seat and, you know, his friend said, hey, come along with me and, you know, two IFR pilots, you can help me out. Um, when they landed the PPL or the, the pilot said, you know, what'd you think? And he says, do, so the answer was, do you want the truth or a lie? There was no pre-flight briefing. There was no walk around. There was no run up. There was no CRM. Uh, the airline pilot actually offered assistance a couple times during the flight because the guy was struggling, ended up stepping in. And the guy's response was, well, we got here, didn't we? You know, mm, yeah, but, you know, let's, let's, let's be a little bit more professional. So I want to leave you today with this final thought. What are you doing to, to um, improve your safety? What can you take out of what we've talked about today to enhance what you're doing? And let me just get to there. Uh, just a quick reminder, um, I need you to pop into the chat and, and again, re-enter your name and your, your um, license code. And I'm gonna open this final chat here. I'd love to hear from you. What are you taking out of today? What is the thing that really popped for you that you say, you know what, this is actually a good, good, good use of my time today. And, you know, I'm gonna take that back to my club and implement it. So those are your two missions. Pop your, your name and, and number into the chat so that we've got record. And what are you taking out of today? Uh, we'll give it a few minutes to, to hear a few things, and then we'll uh, give you what your logbook entry is so that you can make it official and, and have your, your sign off. And of course, I'm gonna open, if anyone wants to unmute and talk and versus typing, totally fine with either. Tell it's late in the day, I can't type. Here we go. All right. Some of the mental health issues there. Currency is critical. Pre flight visualization, love it. Think safety, put safety first. Reduce that pressure. Lose the attitude. Oh, whoever put that in, thank you so much. Love that. That's not only gonna help yourself, it's gonna help your, your fellow club members around you. Love it, role model, currency, awareness. This is awesome, thank you so much. Act on those intentions, reduce the pressure, planning. Got to keep your head in, consider those human factors. So distraction, yeah. And I, I really brought this to the surface last year when we started into COVID because it is a big distraction. Um, but also as we 